My name is Sean Williams. I'm a senior aviation accident investigator from the central region based out of Chicago. So, like I said, thank you all for being here. Is there a lot of feedback on this? That's going to be my presentation so you guys can see it. Okay. okay, so just a few logistical items here. We have water and coffee available just outside the doors. Guest Wi-Fi information is on the wall, and there's some pamphlets outside, so be sure you guys grab those on your way in and out. Bathrooms are located on this floor just outside the door, uh, past the community common area out there on the right-hand side. In case of an emergency, please exit the room via the three exit doors. There's one back there and two up at the front. Proceed downstairs and we'll exit the building out the main doors where you guys came in. So here's kind of how the program will work today. First up, I'll run through opening presentation, just kind of a level set. We'll run through a case study. And then, then we'll kick off the panel immediately thereafter. So before I begin, I'd like to thank Brian Burns the Air Charter Safety Foundation for suggesting that we host a panel discussion before tomorrow's symposium. Brian contributed to development of the panel and we're definitely grateful for your help. All right, so although I investigate all types of accidents, you know, my area of, of interest, what I really try to specialize in is part 135 especially those with the operational overtones. So a little bit of background about me here. So I came from the 121 world where I came, kind of came through the ranks there. Flew up and down the East Coast for a, a regional carrier. And then from there I went on to the FAA. So I was there in Anchorage, Alaska. I was an operations inspector. While there, I join the certification services oversight program team. So what we did is all new 135 certifications for the state of Alaska. So we did that in 2014. I think I worked 75 new applications. So part 135 is definitely where I feel the most comfortable. So why are we here today? Well, part 135 accidents continue to be a concern for us. That's why this is on the most wanted list. We want to try to prevent these from happening in the future. So I'll start this, start this afternoon by walking through some accident data. We'll discuss the recurring safety concerns and the resulting safety priorities. We'll talk about these things at first, then we'll look at an accident that could have been prevented if our recommendations had been acted upon. But our real goal through today's session is to use the knowledge, experience, and insights of our panelists to figure out practical ways to get the biggest bang for the buck. We believe in safety management systems and flight data monitoring programs. So we wanted to hear more from the part 135 operators and specifically, where are your challenges in implementing them? How are you scaling SMS to your operations? Who has implemented an FDM program? What works? What doesn't? Where are you headed with that program? The operators that join us today will be undoubtedly provide us with some unique and important insights into these issues. This is a collaborative effort, folks. We're hopeful today will allow all of us to better assess where we are collectively. We aren't gonna fix the world in a day, but Rome was built one day at a time. So let's jump right into a little bit of data here because let's be honest, what would an NTSB presentation be without a couple graphs, right? So the data contained in this slide and the next one I have is current through January 27th of this year. So since January 5th of 2008, there have been 549 Part 135 accidents. One thing to keep in mind about this chart, an accident may have more than one causal factor. So by adding all these up, you're not gonna get to the 549. As an example, if you had an inadvertent IMC encounter which led to a loss of control, that's gonna count for both of them. So this graph shows that 77 accidents were attributed to a system component failure, 75 were a loss of control in flight. 
So this is all of part 135. In just a second, we'll cover the, the fatal side of it. We'll see a little bit of a change. We'll see where more of this SMS and FDM really comes into play. So you may be asking why there's no line graph showing a trend. Sometimes they can be misleading. When you don't know the number of hours or flights flown, you don't know that you're getting the most accurate stuff. You can't really trend that. For example, it would show 44 accidents for 2019, but only three for this year. We don't really have that much of a downward trend, right? Also, a lot of the investigations are still ongoing, and that can kind of change the data as we move through. So let's take a look at the fatal accidents. Of those 549, 115 involved at least one fatality. Again, this is from the same time frame, 2008 to January 27th. The leading causes we see here, the loss of control in flight and CFIT. Just remember when I said there could be more, more than one cause. <clears throat> so what do these charts have in common? They don't capture what companies involved had an SMS or an FDM. They don't capture what accidents could have been prevented with an SMS or an FDM program. So let's look at the safety issues that we see in these accidents. So our first issue here is operational monitoring. It's an important area for improvement as evidenced by findings in our investigations. FDM and safety assurance as part of, a, part of an SMS are tools to help you figure out where to focus your time, talent, and resources to get the most return on investment for your safety efforts. Well, why do we think that? Well, an FDM program, and let me stress the word program, having the equipment installed on your aircraft and not doing anything with it does nothing to improve safety. If anything, it adds weight and reduces your fuel load. So the FDM program can help you as a company pick up on events that may not have resulted in an accident this time, but with a small change in conditions, could have been catastrophic. We'll discuss one of those later on that did just that. Several previous flights involving the same SOP non-compliance didn't result in an accident, but months later it did, along with two fatalities. Now, before you start thinking, here we go again. He's going to talk about Teterboro. He's going to talk about Akron. I can assure you I'm not. <clears throat> I'm going to use an accident that has not been previously presented by the NTSB. I know this because I looked around to try to steal the presentation. So our second safety issue, safety management, it's key to reducing accidents overall, especially fatal accidents, by institutionalizing a safety culture throughout the organization. So how do we build a safety culture? Set conservative, effective safety priorities. Prioritize resources to execute those policies. Use safety risk assessment methods, aided by an FDM program, there's that word again, to help you determine the hazards that present the most risk in your operation. So the FDM program also gives you a mechanism to monitor the results of those policies and to replan focus resources if needed before the hazard turns into an accident. So they kind of go hand in hand. And an SMS gives you proven solutions. You know what works, what doesn't work. And you can share those lessons learned down the chain within your own organization as well as within the safety community. Delivering proven solutions that reduce safety risk enhances the credibility of the Part 135 industry and builds trust with your employees who are then willing to buy into the SOPs, right? So the NTSB believes that implementation of an SMS will reduce the risk of fatal accidents in Part 135. Saying what you're going to do, doing what you're going to say, promotes that credibility and trust up and down the organization, which generates your positive safety culture. So a well-established SMS program will have the buy-in of the employee group. You can say you have the best safety program in the world. It's robust. It starts at the top down. I can't tell you the number of times I've heard that in interviews following a fatal accident. But if at the end of the day, the employees think there's going to be safety repercussions, they're not going to report things that need to be reported. Furthermore, those same companies that told me about their robust safety program, when we moved down the line and started interviewing the employees, they didn't know about it. 
Or, well, there's a website. I don't know how to use it. Or we have a safety form somewhere. If your employees feel comfortable saying something without those fear of repercussions, you're going to have a safer organization. So I want you to think about that as we move through this case study. Feeling comfortable saying something. All right, so the way I want to do this case study, I'll first give an overview of the accident, then we'll go back and we'll look at some of the precursor events that could have been discovered with an FDM program, possibly prevented with an SMS. So on May 5th, 2017 at 651 Eastern Time, Air Cargo Carriers, or ACC, Flight 1260 was in Shorts SD3 crashed during landing on runway 5 in Charleston, West Virginia. The airplane was destroyed and the two pilots were fatally injured. The company was based in Milwaukee and em employed 103 employees, including 38 pilots, 25 of which were captains who also acted as reserve pilots, and 13 FOs. They operated 18 airplanes, and pilots typically lived at one of the 12 bases, as this crew did, and had a permanent crew pairing. The company had minimal operational oversight programs. So the flight was a scheduled cargo flight from Louisville, Kentucky, operated under Part 135. The time of the accident, weather was reported as overcast clouds at 510 miles visibility, with light winds. However, the ATIS was indicating the previous observation of 1300 overcast. ATC did not update the recording or advise the pilots. The flight was executing a VOR alpha approach, which is aligned with the flight's inbound course, but requires a circle to land maneuver. So the airplane came in from the left side of this graphic over the Charleston VOR. The approach has a step down altitude of 1720 MDA of 1600, which is 619 above the airport. Missed approach point is Maxa, which is eight miles from the VOR. Radar indicated that the pilot descended to 1600 two miles prior to the step down fix. Proceeded very close to the airport, made a steep turning descent to the runway. Video and physical evidence shows the airplane descending from the cloud base very close to the airport and making that steep descent left banking turn to line up with runway five. So here's the profile view flown by the accident crew. Notice the steep descent followed by a climb and then another descent down to where they busted the 1720. They stayed there. So a little bit of background here. So the captain had about 4,600 hours, worked in Alaska as a bush pilot. He'd been hired in 2015. 2016, he received notice of disapproval on his ATP ride due to excessive deflection, both glide slope and localizer for an ILS approach. Repeated glide slope and syncrate warnings from the JIPWIS and his subsequent failure to initiate a go around. He passed the practical re-exam three days later. Witness information included times he showed off videos making steep approaches. Historical ATC data between January and April of 2017 of three VOR alpha approaches, the same as the accident flight, into Charleston, indicated that the captain descended below the MDA while in IMC in all three approaches. The first officer, she had about 600 hours total time. 300 in the shorts, so she was a former flight attendant working towards an airline job. Air cargo carriers at the time of the accident did not have a flight data monitoring program. So what do you think? Could they have benefited from an established program? So we talked about some of those previous flights. Here they are plotted. Would something like this help in your organization? Could this guide an increase in oversight for a crew member? What if it's more than one crew member? Could it be indicative of, of a systemic issue? Could it even lead maybe to navigate issues at the airport? 
you don't need expensive equipment to run an FDM program. You can have a rudimentary program using ADSB or even something like a spider track system. You can get altitudes, ground speeds, track information, etc. Granted, the equipment gives you more information, more parameters, so you can have that more robust program. But to get started and see what it can do for you, it doesn't take a huge front end investment unless you want to hit the ground running. So each of the former ACC pilots that were interviewed stated they had witnessed instances of SOPs being disregarded when they were flying at air cargo carriers. One former FO, so there was a culture where senior pilots with experience as captains felt like they could bend the rules, bend the boundaries of SOPs, and the FOs may not be taken seriously. When this specific first officer encountered the behavior, he responded by doing additional training and more studying on his own to become more confident in the aircraft, and be better able to speak up about the issues to a captain. A former captain stated he had flown with a handful of pilots who flew way outside of SOPs. Some pilots wouldn't be standardized. So who here is familiar with the term procedural drift? Okay, so we mentioned that permanent crew pairing, right? So procedural drift is a phenomenon in which crew members perform procedures but don't encounter an example of its effectiveness as a safety protection. As a result, they may experience a decreased perception of the procedures, leading them to disregard the procedure and reallocate their effort toward other goals that they perceive as more important. Such changes can lead to a new set of norms about what is expected and an increasing disparity between written guidance and actual operating practice. So with that in mind, I want to read here few text messages. This is between the accident first officer and a friend of hers. This was prior to the accident, of course. So these are contained in the public docket for the accident, so I can share them. If you want to know more, you guys can access that public docket online. So it starts off, just had the biggest scare of my life, thought I was going to die. I got to the airport last night. There was a blizzard outside. It was super windy and gusty. Once we were off the ground, we went to put the gear up and saw that the nose gear light stayed on instead of indicating it was up and locked. The captain said he'd fly while I went to look up the checklist. Before I even finished going through the checklist, we went into the clouds and lost all visual reference of the ground. And this is West Virginia. There's hills everywhere. Captain wanted to get out of the clouds, so he immediately turned right where I know there's these hills, making really steep turns, 60 degrees of bank, descending at 800 feet per minute. The whole time, I'm like, we're going to hit the hills. We're going to hit the hills. We finally broke out of the clouds. When I looked down to my left a little, there was just a big black hole where that hill was. So now I'm looking around for the airport, and the captain saw it and said it was behind us and to the right, so he started turning that way. But then we went into the clouds again, and I could tell he was getting disoriented. We're also turning and descending, and you have to watch your airspeed and bank. When we finally broke out again, the airport was right below us, so we couldn't line in for the runway we wanted. So we called and asked to land in the opposite direction. 18, gusting up to 30. I think since we came in a little fast and with the crazy crosswind, it started pushing us off the runway. I was for sure we were going to run off the side of the runway, up the bank, and flip over. Do you remember those pictures from the approach from the surveillance video? Kind of the same thing. We were only a few feet from hitting the bank on the side of the runway when he was able to turn it back. We called the chief pilot. He was like, yeah, put the pins in. You should be fine. And off they went. So she continues on to talk about what she would have done. I feel like we should have asked for vectors. She says, we fly in the clouds all the time. When the ceiling's low, you do an approach instead of flying visual. So that tells you right there, they were in and out of IMC while visual. And it continues that I'm flying with him as long as I stay in Charleston. And then there's one more that's really just disheartening. The captain is sleeping. I'm going to need you to keep me entertained for the rest of the flight. 
and I'm the one flying right now, texting and flying because texting and driving is played out. So here's a picture of the ADS-B track from that flight. Each of these dots has information with them. You click on them. It'll tell you ground speed. It'll tell you heading or altitude. So something even like this, could this be helpful in your organization? The equipment's already installed, right? So according to the chief pilot, ACC had no formal or documented irregularity or safety reporting program. To issue a report, pilots were expected to call or email the director of training or the chief pilot. This process was the same for reporting difficulties with colleagues. Safety reports were not formally logged nor tracked, and there was no method to research or evaluate trends of safety or irregularity calls. In fact, former pilots stated pilots didn't know who to go to with problems. Kind of goes back to that, we have a robust program, right? Although there was no program, they did have a safety form. Let me stress the word form. This singular form was for everything from customer service issues to safety of flight information gathered by a crew, as well as NTSB 830 information. One form. Do you think the FO filling out that one safety form would have been enough? What kind of confidence would the FO have that something like something would have been done? And there's not even a crew form, right? It's one for everything. So where does it go? Nobody knows. Okay, so we all know about the four pillars of SMS. I don't want to beat a dead horse on it. So let's look at how they relate to this accident. There was a generic safety policy being used. Little safety communication once the pilot transitioned away from, from Milwaukee, away from the mothership, right? They're on their own. You're with your crew, you're at your outstation. Call us if there's a problem. No dedicated formal and documented safety reporting program, no ASAP, no hotline. No dedicated venue to report safety concerns aside from that singular form. Reporting actual safety data wasn't prioritized or captured, which means flight safety data could be identified or trended. And there was little oversight due to the logistics and complexity of the outstation operations. The only time management would come through is if a pilot was on vacation. They would come in and fill the hole. So if air cargo carriers had an FDM program, they may have caught the previous SOP violations, but would they have done anything? That all depends on the safety culture, and that's why we're here today. If there was a structured program, would the FO have reported her concerns? Again, would anything have changed? The answer is the same. It depends, and we'll never know. What we do know is that after the accident, they took immediate steps to address their safety concerns. We like to give credit where credit's due. <clears throat> ACC developed a formal safety program, documenting it based on AC 120-92. They developed through the use of commercial safety tools an ACAR safety reporting tool, web-based, that included flight ops safety report, injury reports, and general safety reports. Additionally, they hired a director of safety with oversight responsibility. So let's discuss the safety programs and cultures as a group here today to prevent this kind of accident from occurring at your company. We don't want to be looking back and have to go back and make these changes. Let's be proactive about it. So now, without further ado, let's move into why you're all here, the panel discussion. The major topics will include SMS and scalability, FDM, ASAP programs, and unique aspects to Part 135 operation. Audience Q&A will take place near the close of the panel. For those of you turn, tuning in online, please submit your questions to safetyadvocacy at mtsb.gov. So please allow me to introduce our two hosts for the panel. 
First, the Honorable Member Michael Graham. Member Graham began his career in the U.S. Navy as a naval aviator flying A-7s and F-18s. Completed two operational deployments, including combat air patrol missions over Iraq and Kuwait, in support of Southern Watch. From 97 until 2019, he was with Textron Aviation. From 2012 to 2019, he served as a Director of Flight Operations Safety, Security, and Standardization. As many of you know, Michael, Member Graham also served as Chairman of the Air Charter Safety Foundation and Board of Governors. He's a certified ATP with over 10,000 flight hours, type rated in six different citation models. Member Graham joined the NTSB in January of this year. And second, but absolutely not least, the Honorable Chairman Robert Sumwalt. Chairman Sumwalt began his tenure at the NTSB in August of 06, when President George W. Bush appointed him to the board and designated him as vice chairman. On August 10, 2017, after being nominated by President Donald Trump and confirmed by the U.S. Senate, Chairman Sumwalt was sworn in as the 14th chairman of the NTSB. Before joining the NTSB, he flew for 32 years, including 24 with Piedmont Airlines and U.S. Airways accumulating over 14,000 flight hours. Chairman Sumwalt also has experience managing a corporate aviation department for a Fortune 500 energy company. It's my privilege to introduce Member Graham and Chairman Robert Sumwalt. Sean, thank you for that uh, really good presentation. And you know, one of the things you pointed out is that is that the organization involved in that crash uh, implemented safety measures after the crash. And we see that a lot of times, is that after a crash, somebody comes in and fixes whatever problems they had. Obviously, we want to fix those problems so that there is no crash. So um, really good job, thank you. I wanna uh, make a shout out to uh, Adam Gerhardt, one of our air safety investigators. Adam, uh, really, did the bulk of the work for organizing today's roundtable uh, in terms of the technical work and all. And uh, unfortunately, he's homesick today. I don't think it's uh, COVID-19. Uh, don't think it's uh, coronavirus, but uh, he's under the weather so much so that he didn't want to come and infect all of us. So Adam, uh, I know you're watching. Hope you feel better. Thank you. The flow of the show today will be, uh, there will be six topic areas. Each will be about 20 minutes. We will, uh, uh, Mike and I will share uh, the panels. Each of us will take sort of the lead on a panel and then the other will serve as the backup. Back uh, we'll take a break after, uh, after two of the panels, somewhere around 2.10. As you know, uh, improved safety of Part 135 operations is on our most wanted list. And really when we talk about that, there's really three things that are underpinning that particular topic area. There is the need for SMS. There's the need for flight data monitoring. And for airplanes, CFED avoidance training. Now that is currently required as of 2014 for helicopter Part 135 but as you know, it's not required for airplanes. Tell you what, why don't we start out by having each of the panelists introduce themselves. Uh, tell us who you are and where you work. Glad to have each of you here. I'm Gary Bowser. I'm the chief pilot at Gamma Aviation, Wheels Up. <clears throat> I'm Todd Anguish. I'm the chief safety officer at FlexJet. I'm uh, John Fulton, and I'm the Director of Operations at CTP Aviation in California. I'm Ken Gray. I'm the Director of Operations for Executive Flightways in uh, Long Island, New York. Jeff Baum, President and CEO of Wisconsin Aviation. We're a full-service FBO, and we have small airplanes as well as big ones. <coughs> Janine Schwann, Director of Operations and Director of Safety at Summit Aviation in Bozeman, Montana. Thank you all for, for being here. And also, thanks for, uh, for being here uh, in person. I'd like to find out at some point uh, what our total attendance is. We know we have about 120 in here. We've got an overflow room, but I'd be curious to know how many people we have online. So we'll check in on that at some point. The first panel will be to 
um, talk about an overview of operations and SMS. And we know that SMS is defined as ICAO as an organized approach to managing safety, including the necessary organizational structures, accountabilities, policies, and procedures. Whenever I read that, I'm like, hey, that's just a bunch of words. So I'd like for you all, and then it's got this, this graphic here where we have the four components. We all know what that is, the four pillars. And I read each of those. But I'm still asking myself, what does that mean? So can we put some meat on that bone in terms of what SMS really is, how is it applied, and how does it improve safety? Why don't we hear, some, hear from some of the panelists? Uh, I think we all know, let's just get this, uh, say it from the very beginning. In panel two, we'll talk about the scalability of SMS. So I think we all acknowledge that SMS has to be scalable. We've got sort of the full gamut of part 135 operations. We've got relatively small and we've got relatively large. Todd, uh, you've got 140 uh, aircraft, 750 pilots on the lower end in terms of size. We've got uh, Ken and Janine somewhere with around five or six airplanes and anywhere between 16 and 25 pilots. So we've got a pretty good cross-section of, um, of, of size here. Todd, you're certainly uh, one of the largest operators. On, or you are the largest operator on this panel. So why don't we start out with you? Uh, give us an overview of how you are using the principles of SMS and, uh, and what's that look like at, at FlexJet. And Ken, I want you to pay attention because I'll be asking the same question of you in just a moment. So Todd, go ahead. That's a good question. Thank you first uh, for the opportunity to um, speak here on the panel uh, amongst a, a bunch of great uh, organizations. Um, we appreciate your time, and um, I think as Chairman Sumwalt and Sean uh, put it, we're all here in the interest of improving safety, and I think that's really what it's all about. Um, in our SMS program, um, you know, it's evolved um, over the years. In fact, it's evolved in approximately 15 years, and <clears throat> we started small just like anybody would, would start with the program, and over over the years, you're continuously making improvements and refinements to the program. And you talk about scalability, that's, that's one of the important aspects of it. Um, really, the meat of our program is uh, just culture and uh, a positive reporting program. Because I, can't, I, I don't think that it could exist without either one of the two. And they really kind of go hand in hand. And we'll, we'll probably get into just culture in a little bit. But, um, in, in the reporting, we try to take anything that we get and, and try to see if there's an area of opportunity for us to improve. And if there is, we, we will act on it. And, and I think that's, that's the, the biggest benefit that we can have in our overall program, um, is taking that, that step of, you know, sometimes you're going to have to be reactive to things. Um, but really you, what you want to try to do is be proactive and try to prevent them in the first place. Thanks. Ken, you've got uh, what you've got about uh, 16 pilots, six aircraft. Mm -hmm. How is SMS being used in your organization? Tell us a little bit about your organization and what you're doing. Well, what we originally set out to do about 15 years ago was get his BAO certification for marketing purposes. But very quickly, we realized there was some real benefit to having uh, a healthy SMS. And when you're a smaller company, the way we look at it is if there's a mistake made and we analyze it and we figure out what was wrong, what we did wrong, or what procedures are, need correction, or what procedures aren't even described in our manuals, we go ahead and we make those changes. And if that accident or that incident never happens again, we describe that in baseball terms as a single. But what we try to do is get all 50 employees from the minute they come into the parking lot to the minute they leave the parking lot to have their eyes open to see what potential conflicts are out there. 
And if somebody comes to us and says, hey, you know, I was thinking about this, and we really don't have a procedure to prevent this. And we say, oh yeah, you know, you're, you're correct. So let's go ahead and figure out, get the safety board together, come up with a procedure, and we make the changes. And it never occurs, that's the home run. And if you look at history here in the American League and National Leagues, it's the home run teams that win the World Series. And that's, that's our goal now. And we, being here in Washington, D.C., would appreciate the analogy <laughs> to uh, winning the World Series. Um, thank you very much. So, Jeff, I understand that you're about 20% complete with SMS. And what do you mean or about 80%? Uh, what does that mean uh, when you say about 80% complete? Well, I, I, I'm not sure that we're even 80% complete, to tell you the truth. Uh, our company, we operate everything from Piper Senecas up through Citations. So it's a, it's a real variety of aircraft in there. And... I guess if I trace back our history on SMS, I learned about it through the Air Charter Safety Foundation when we first started talking about it and that this thing was coming. I went back to my flight ops guys, our vice president of flight operations and our chief pilot, and I said, listen, you know, we're going to have to start working on a safety management system. And they go, yeah, we don't need that. We know what we're doing. And that's, you know, I think that's one of the core problems was trying to move forward with the safety management system. Pilots are pilots in command. You know, don't tell me what to do. I know what I'm doing. I'm the, I make the decisions every day. But anyway, uh, I, I brought a couple of them here to the Air Charter Safety Foundation uh, symposiums, and our VP of Flight Operations finally said, okay, I get it. Uh, I, I see what we need. He told the chief pilot this. chief pilot went out, came back uh, some months later and said, hey, I found us an SMS. It's cost us about 900 bucks, you know, and we can get this book. No, that's, that's not SMS. <laughs> Uh, so we've been developing our own, but the problem with a smaller company like ours is resources in terms of people and dollars to put it together. And so we've been piecing it together. The good news is I think we've moved the needle quite a bit on how we do things. And also what's interesting is I think many of the people in our other areas outside of flight ops, our line services and so forth and maintenance, have caught on to the idea of the SMS much more perhaps even than the pilots. That's a great, uh, great point you raised there. You also mentioned the Air Charter Safety Foundation. Brian, I want to thank you personally, as well as the Air Charter Safety Foundation, for the leadership that, that you, you and your organization are providing. I don't think we would have this event today if it weren't uh, for you and the Air Charter Safety Foundation. So thank you. So Jeff, you raise a good point. I'd love to hear, the, hear from the panelists on this. That's sort of always been my impression that you can't just go out and buy SMS. So. I appreciate that you can go out and buy sort of the templates, but you really have to own it and make it your own. Any comments on that? Well, the safety promotion part of all the four elements working in balance, that probably is the most critical because that's where we all put the mechanisms in place. But unless we're driving to the point where every employee feels they are an integral part of the safety management system, they are it. And so that the idea as you're quizzed, do you know how to file a report? Do you know how to do this? Do you know how to do that? It's not, well, I need to know that. It's I want to know that. I want to be part of the process. So it's that level of participation I think we're all talking about. We've evolved, all of us, from a point where SMS or a safety program or department was a requirement. Now it's something we desire. We all want it. And I think that evolution is what will carry us to greater success. So it's you, you want it, how do you get it? How do you, how do you get to there? And maybe there is no there there. Maybe it's a continuous journey. But right. how, do you, how do you get on the right road and continue that journey? John, you're nodding your head. Well, we've, uh, we're in California. We've got eight airplanes. Uh, you know, we've been on that road for about 10 years. I think we started our SMS really in response to just frankly, passing audits, uh, checking squares. Uh, but over time, we've realized that uh, it needs to be a normal part of the culture. It has to be normal ops, not something uh, where you have a website that you have to make your way to to make a report. And uh, so that's what we're shooting for, something one button on an iPad. If you see something, you report it right now. And it happens now. Maybe there's a color code for risk assessment there so that we don't have to, uh, so it doesn't have to be a ponderous process. And that's what we're working on. Fantastic. 
So um, I don't want to be the one to necessarily a ask all the questions. So if you have something on a particular topic that we're discussing, just uh, give me the high sign and we'll certainly call on you. Meanwhile, uh, Todd, uh, um, you told uh, Adam when we were developing, uh, getting ready for today, that SMS has really helped FlexJet to improve the company's safety culture, which allows you to continuously improve. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think one of the you know one of the challenges um, we've faced in the past, and and really still, uh, as you hire new employees, is getting them engaged. And and you you speak to the point of you know, you, you're trying to get them engaged and really realize that they are safety. It's not just a safety department, right? And that's where I think the program is, is most functional. When people realize that they are a key component in safety in the organization, that's when, that's when I think you're on the right track. <clears throat> Your voice matters. You really have to believe that. I think the feeling if you embrace the fact that we're human and we are, are going to make mistakes, then it's okay, to, the classic phrase, to come out from under the radar. And it's okay, here I am, here I am, I made a mistake or I have an idea. And once you get that buy-in, then you're on the road to success. I think one of the things you have to do, is, it has to come from the ground up. It can't be dictated from the top down. But it's designed it has, to come from the top down, isn't it? Yes, it dictates. But, it, but you have to have that everybody <laughs> believing, mm -hmm. otherwise it's not going to work. Right. You can't, you can't dictate and say, we're going to have an SMS and you're going to follow it. Mm -hmm. No, you know, that doesn't work. Yeah. I hear what you're saying. You have to have that buy-in all through the organization, through. but I'm going to suggest that that message, and you're the president of your organization, I believe, that has to start with you and permeate throughout the entire organization. So how do you do that? I mean, you're right, you can't just go to an Air Charter Safety Foundation meeting and come back and say, oh, we're going to have SMS, we're going to, to do that. So, so how did you skin that cat? I know you're continuously in that process, but how do you skin that cat to say, here's what we want to do, and then get that buy-in throughout the entire organization? Well, it's through an education process, number one, but number two, you also find people that um, believe in the message and help have them help carry it through. So in every organization, you're gonna find some people that, that you know, say, yeah, this is a great idea, this is something we need. And you'll have some that say, you know, hey, we know what we're doing, we don't have to do that. So you use those people that, that believe in it and that are gonna help you carry it. And they bring the message to others. Thank you very much. And uh, Ken, I think you wanted to jump in Actually, on that. Actually, I just have a question for everybody else. Do you find that you get the same level of commitment to the program from different departments? I find typically that the pilot department has a great buy-in, but it's much harder to get dispatch much harder to get maintenance involved in SMS. Why do you think that is? Well, it's kind of like the bacon and egg sandwich. You know, the chicken's involved, but the pig's committed. <laughs> and, you know, the pilots have their, and, it's, it's a crude way of putting it, but so sure. for, for all of you, for all of you pilots in the room, um, um, anyway, no. But, you know, the pilots, uh, they have their seat, you know, they're, they're rear end in the seat every day, and, and for them to get home, they really have to concentrate on safety. And the dispatchers, you know, they want to get the planes out, the maintenance, you know, want to get the planes out, and, Management wants to get the planes out, but that's why I, I think feel. part of it too is that the the makeup of the individual who probably is an aviator is I want to tell you my story, and it's you know let's stop talking about flying, let's talk about me. So with that idea, we want to tell our story, and here we're creating vehicles to tell that story. Maintenance, you do it, you keep it in the shop. Dispatch. I did this, I did this, I did this. So maybe that's part of it, the personality. And so you have to develop it to get the other people to participate. Thanks, Mike, uh, questions? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> let's stay on that subject a little bit about buy-in. Okay, I ran my own SMS there for a number of years before I came to the board. And I understand you're not gonna be successful at SMS unless you get employee buy-in. You're not gonna get reports or anything like that. So. I want to ask each of you, I think well, at least five of you have a, a full SMS running right now. Was there one thing that happened, maybe an event, or one thing that the CEO did that got everybody to buy in to your SMS? What's the most important thing to get people to buy into the SMS? 
Janine, you want to start us? Yeah, for, for us, it was, it's actually, it's a generation thing. You guys are all pilots. You all went to training. Were you ever taught SMS when you're working on your private pilot certificate or your instrument rating? Why is it that we go all the way through all of our training and nothing is put in place until suddenly you're 135 or 121 and now you have to train? I mean, the law of primacy, right? It's first thing, learn best remembered, but we don't learn it. And if anything, we're told, you know, oh, you did something wrong, don't talk about it. The FAA is going to get you for it. But now suddenly you're 121 or 135, you have ASAP and you're protected for it now. So now we can all talk about it. But that's not what, how we were raised. So it now with the newer flight schools and the newer generation of pilots, we're not having this kind of issue where we're, get, we're having trouble of having them tell us. In fact, I'm getting the best intel from all my young co-pilots. They come to us, they tell us what's going on because that's how they were raised. They've been, they're raising now in flight schools and flight training programs to do FRATs, to, do, to have safety programs. So now I think we're finally starting to get over the hump where safety people are talking about it and it's okay, but still there's that stigma. I mean, when I went for my interviews with the airlines, they asked, did you fail a check ride? Why is that a problem? Isn't failing a check ride good? It means that you weren't ready, but now you've been retrained and now you are. It doesn't, I mean, if we're up here and we're all saying that we want them to tell us what's going wrong with the culture, then we also have to celebrate what's going right with the culture. We stop somebody from getting a rating, right? But, but we're like, but don't talk about it. I mean, you can't during an interview or how many stage checks you failed or anything like that. But that's, that's all good. That's what we need to talk about. We need to talk about not just the good, but we also need to talk about the bad. But it has to start from flight training, from private and instrument and commercial all through there. Not just something that suddenly, oh, well, welcome to 121 and 135. We're safer because now we have an SMS program. I know you don't want to talk about it because you weren't trained that way. So that's the biggest buy-in that we've seen on our program. And like our frats were developed by our pilots. I went to them and I said, what do you think your aircraft specifically, what makes it dangerous? What, what makes you nervous? And so they wrote them and they scaled them and we change it all the time. They come back and they're like, I've got a score of 12 and ours flags at 11 on a certain type. But it was a perfect day. It shouldn't be flagging at 12. Okay, well, let's, let's play with it some more. So I don't think you can say that you're 5% complete with MS, SMS or you've got 100% program because then it's not doing what it's supposed to do and that's constantly changing. What I don't want is after an accident, the NTSB would be like, well, you don't have a full SMS program. Well, nobody should. That's the whole point, is that it's developing and it's changing. But it's just that we're talking about it. That makes it important. Amen to that. It's a living program. It's always changing. That's what SMS is. Anybody want to add to that real quick? There were two vehicles that we explored. We were out in front of people. We were using the mechanisms that we were taught. And we said, how can we increase reporting? Because ultimately, that's one of the foundations of how we're going to. And I've always been fascinated by the fact where a system says, sign in. Check this box if you want this report to be anonymous. So we did an experiment. And we said, no sign in required. But please put your name on if you'd like to be part of the process. 99.9% .9 of the people identified themselves. Mm -hmm. No sign in required. Exponential rise in reporting. The second item that was very successful, as is necessary, we would issue alerts or notifications for immediate need, GOM revisions, so forth and so on. Still have to do it. But we started using newsletters like NASA Callback. And we put that out there. And we put a line in there that said, don't judge the reporter. Use this information so that you can decide how you might handle it when it happens to you. The, the response was dramatic. So we're striving in that direction, which I think everybody is. And that's that part of that openness. Great, thank you. Um, for those of you that have, uh, you would say, a living SMS program fully right now, um, let's talk about audits. I know that's been an issue been pointed out in some uh, accidents that the NTSB has investigated. And how many of you uh, out of the five have uh, get audited, an SMS audit? Okay. Can I ask how often? Set six times a year. Six times a year? Okay. Todd? Well, under the FAA oversight, it's continuously um, externally um, every two years with the major um, audits. 
Okay. Not at company. John? We're the same externally, two years. Two years? Yeah. yeah FAA, same with the uh, FAA, and then we have two, three <clears throat> external audits, about some, somewhere between 18 and 24 months. Yeah. Janine? The same. Same. Externally, two different audits. Okay. That's Every pretty year. much industry standard. So, out of that, do you feel that the audit actually highlights the weaknesses of your program as well as the strengths? And maybe another way of putting it, uh, does it truly evaluate the overall health of your SMS? Is it making you safer? Ken? You know, it's great to make sure that the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. And uh, there have been audits uh, where they pointed out some weaknesses that we were able to fix. But they don't really address the culture of the com company. And there was an individual years ago who used to come and audit us for uh, three Fortune 100 companies. And he had a really interesting method where he would get our manuals uh, a week or two ahead of time. He'd read through our manuals. And his audit consisted of, uh, I want to interview three captains, three co-pilots, three maintenance technicians. And he would interview them. And then that's how he would pass judgment on whether we were doing what we were saying. Very good. Anybody else have yeah, a comment on that before we switch over? Yeah, I think we're, we're out of time on this topic. But I think this, this is a, a point that I'd like to make on this topic. Audits are extremely important. In fact, we've taken our internal audits um, and, and made them fivefold. So for example, we used um, not only industry best practice audits, uh, we used the actual external audits that we were being audited by, uh, those checklists. Um, but now we've moved into the FAA DCT um, program. So we've incorporated that into our SMS as well. And that, that is really where I think it, it's allowing us to continuously catch things that might not be caught in a, a time shot, if you will, every two years in an external audit. So I think auditing, when we talk about that, I think the most important thing regard to that is internal auditing. Great, thank you. Okay, we're gonna move uh, to a different subject now. We're gonna talk about the scalability of your SMS. And I'd like to start with Jeff, since uh, you're working on your SMS out there. What are the challenges to implementing the SMS for you and scaling it for your operation? Well, the biggest challenge we have is personnel. Um, everybody knows what the pilot situation's like and, and uh, uh, how hard it is to, to keep and uh, get and keep pilots. We've been very fortunate. Our average pilot is probably 8,000 hours, so we have good experience there. But just having the ability of our management in our flight ops to have the time to develop, fully develop the SMS. And I want to kick back just a little bit on the audit part of it. The Air Charter Safety Foundation was developed in part to have an industry audit standard, a very tough audit. One of the problems with that is the scalability of it, trying to get it down to smaller aircraft like flying a Piper Seneca and, and having two uh, you know, uh, trained pilots that go to, to uh, simulator-based training every, every six months. The, uh, <clears throat> the, the uh, Air Charter Safety Foundation, you can get their audit package online, and we use that to help improve and move us further down the road in something we call the pathway to safety. Excellent, thank you, Jeff. Now, for the other smaller operators here, um, Compared to some of the bigger operators, which I'm going to get to here in a minute there, um, can you speak to how you scale your SMS to your operation? Sure. No. Uh, you know, we have eight airplanes. Uh, six are operated 135. And with any relatively small company, uh, the, guys, the, the, the guys in those positions are wearing a lot of hats. And our director of safety is also vice president of maintenance, and he's also a Challenger 350 pilot. Uh, that's a lot for one person to do. And uh, in terms of scalability, I would say the biggest challenge is we would like to uh, we would like to do some statistical analysis of our own data, but uh, you know we get on the safety performance indicators, maybe a dozen reports a year of an FMS mismanagement or an altitude change. Uh, and it takes, uh, it really takes more data to be statistically significant. 
So that's why we're kind of excited about uh, maybe uh, pooling with, uh, with uh, other operators in ACSF, FD, uh, Flight Data Monitoring Plan, um, uh, and then having potentially a, a better statistical basis for making corrections within the safety system. Great, thank you. How about uh, Ken or Janine, do you have anything to add to this for scalability for your size operation? I think it's important that that the person who's in charge of safety, you know, you got to have a safety director or whatever, um, that that person is an active pilot who actively flies the line. Because to be scalable for our organization, which we have five aircraft on, on the charter certificate, the only way to be scalable for us is for us to tackle the issues that are actually running into our crews into the airports that we're operating into. I mean, we do the ISBAO audit, we do you know other audits, and the questions that you're asking, the boxes that you have to check, you're like, that's not even relevant to us. So to be able to have the people, the chief pilot, the director of safety, the director of operations, those people all wear the multiple hats is actually, it's beneficial in our organization for scalability because it keeps us small. Yes, there's a lot to do, but it also keeps us from wasting a bunch of time checking boxes that don't need to be checked and lets us focus on the issues that actually affect us. We fly in the mountains, we fly in the icing, we fly where all the wind shear is. But then there's the other side of it, everybody who flies out in the flatlands and flies on the east coast or the west coast and then come into the mountains. So our, if you look at our fret, it's very much scaled for mountainous terrain and icing. That's what's important to us. That's where we gather the safety reports from our, from our pilots. And having the pilots just give us a conversation. We don't get a lot of safety reports. That's one of our little you know, bad numbers on the audits. We don't have enough of the statistical data. Um, but I don't care because the pilots are at least talking about it. And they're talking to each other. They're talking to the chief pilot. They talk to me. They'll shoot me a text. Hey, this weird thing happened. OK, I don't have a safety report for it officially. but. I know what's happening inside the organization, and that's what's important. Do you document that? A little jotted note okay. in my free time. And do you <laughs> let everybody know what's going on? All so the then, pilots? you know, we have our quarterly meetings, and we, we try and get the information okay. out. But a lot of it's a, a slack nowadays. I mean, you use the technology that you have. Understood. Ken, do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, the, the scalability issue for us is that uh, <coughs> years ago, when we were bigger fleet, we had multiple aircraft of the same type. And so we had pilots that, you know, on one, uh, one type of aircraft, we might have a dozen pilots. But now we have six different types. So the problem for us is that we have three guys that fly together all the time. And to get them to be honest about the performance of their co-pilots is, is, is difficult. And uh, they, they're always worried about the repercussions. And when occasionally when something serious does come up, you hear, I didn't want to rat him out. And that, that's a big issue for us. Understood, thank you. Let me switch over to our two larger operators and ask you uh, each, what kind of resources go into running your SMS on a daily basis? Gary, do you want to lead us off? Significant, and it's increased as the value has displayed itself over time. Um, the, I think we're all faced with this safety being perceived as a center of cost rather than a center of profit. Once you can get the identity that you're gonna ultimately make more money because you have safety as a focus, and it's moving that discussion in the boardroom and then out to the rank and file, um, th that, that I realize that's a very high level aspect of it, but that allows the by default allows the greatest success because this whole game we all participate in is about making money and in an on-demand industry the focus has to be so specific you can't miss a step but it's very easy to do and once it's identified as a money maker you're good to go yeah yeah i agree that's um that's spot on and really you'll, you'll never have enough resources it, though you can always hire more that's people, true right? and you know, in our society of data, you know, drives decisions that, you know, the more data you get, the more you, you, you dig in and you, you realize the need for it. We have a full-time uh, dedicated uh, safety department that, that we're, uh, you know, we have 
24-7 coverage for the operation. We fly a few flights on the back side of the clock, um, depending on where they are in the world. So we have to have the support uh, continuously. Um, but Ken, you asked you know, a, a good question earlier about you know, when it comes to some of the challenges. And I think when you're talking about how do you get people to buy in, um, it is a challenge. And I think one of the things, if I reflect back a couple of years ago that we did in our safety review board, we, we came up with an idea to do a, a survey. And we did a survey across every department in the company. And that feedback is extremely valuable. And it was on reporting. Do you know how to report? Do you know simple things, right? Do you know where to go to report something? Do you, you know, um, if you don't, do you know how to find it? Those kind of things. Um, and you'd be surprised at some of the answers that, that you get. So when you start realizing that, you, you start promoting again. And, you know, I don't want to beat on maintenance guys. I used to be one. <laughs> but we used to fix things and not report it, right? That was some of the feedback we were getting, honest feedback from people saying, well, I just wanted to fix it and you know, I didn't have the time to report it. Well, that reporting piece is just as important as actually fixing it, so. Good point, thank you, Todd. Um, I, I, I don't know how many people are watching us online and, and I'm not sure the, you know, hopefully we'll get that data after the break, we'll get an idea. I hope there's a lot of operators out there and I imagine a lot of them are smaller operators. So what, as a panelist here, what would you say to a small operator out there who would say, hey, my operation is just too small to have an F SMS? What would you say to them? Anybody want to? Well, I, I, what, I, what I would say, the smaller operators are the ones that really, really need the help. If you have 175 jets like Flex, FlexJet does and you have a full-time safety department, you got something going there, but the small guys, and there's what, 2,000, a little over 2,000, 135 operators, I think, in the, in, in the United States, and many of them are one or two planes. Those are the guys that can use some help. So dig into the resources that are available to get started on it and see where it can be a benefit to them. Very good. Ken, or John? You, well, sorry. I would just say, it doesn't have to be complex. Even right. if you're a single right. pilot operator, all that's important is if you see a problem, write it down, and and uh, management will work on it. And uh, so it doesn't need to be a complex system. Uh, you know, the the book, the advisory circular is this thick, um, but uh, don't treat it that way. Very good. Yeah, I I know what you're saying. I, it, it was when I started my program, I was overwhelmed, and it just seemed like there was so much. And then I went back to just. The four, you know, the four foundations to it, and just try to make it as simple as possible, because uh, I was hoping others were struggling with it as much as I was as far as complexity. So, um, Chairman Sumwald, do you have a few questions in this area? Just a few, um, Janine. You and I do agree that it's important to keep your finger on the pulse of the operation, and that if somebody wants to send you a text, um, then you at least know what's going on. But would it be better? to have a central reporting system because how do you statistically or how do you look for trends if you've got a text message here and a yellow sticky note here and, and, and a safety report here? Would it be better uh, to, to uh, have a central reporting system instead of informal? Absolutely, I mean, we have, we have a, a central location, but it's also, it's as simple as a spreadsheet on Excel. It's how we, we started it. And, you know, we categorized it actually the same way that the categories were up there. It's what was it? Was it a, somebody had a runway incursion? Did somebody have a bird strike? And we just started categorizing it that way. When it's a very small operation like ours, you maybe have two or three things that come in. It's not like, you know, Flex where you probably have two or three reports a day kind of a situation where you're collecting that data. I ran a, a two King Air operation for a couple of years. It was a Part 91 operation, and we, we had yellow sticky notes uh, for about everything we did. And we finally decided we have to have a, a common reporting form so that we can look for trends. Bottom line is, though, you do want to find, you do want to find out where your problems are, and however that information comes in is good. Correct, and pilot tape forms. There's, they just want to tell you what happened. They don't want to answer yes or no. 
Was this a TCAS event? Was this a thunderstorm? Was it night? Just they want to put it in a text. They just want to give you the basic data, and that's all I need. So I'll take it however it comes. Good. Thanks. Any comments on that? One of the things that helps too in the idea of involving everyone is that when you create your report, you ask the question, "What's your corrective action? What what would you do differently?" And it's amazing the volume of information that comes in that little the, that big box. It'll get as big as it needs. But. That's a great point there. Let them suggest the corrective action. That's oh, wonderful. Right. And and how important is it to provide that feedback loop that even if you don't implement that corrective action to let them know we've received your report, we appreciate it, we've looked into it, and we just can't do it for X, Y, Z reason. Is that does that have value? Oh sure, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely, most certainly. Yeah, and uh, do we all do go a good enough job of that? No, mm -hmm. right. no, it's just yeah. But they'll stop giving the feedback if, if right. there's oh, no absolutely. response. Yes. Yeah. John, you mentioned uh, the idea of pooling data, and I think the Air Charter Safety Foundation, Brian, I think you told us a couple of weeks ago that through your ASAP program, for example, and we'll talk about ASAP later, there's 175 participants in your ASAP program, and you've gotten over 5,000 reports, I think. So is that an example of what you were talking about of the pooling of, of, of information, of data? Yeah, it certainly is, and, uh, uh, you know, we we would like to take uh, even more advantage of that uh, by looking at the other operators' data and getting feedback to our safety system. Uh, we're also a little bit intrigued by, uh, uh, we just recently joined the FAA's ASIAS program that's new to us, but then there's an opportunity there to share data as well. And, uh, and there are filters available uh, where if you're operating to a new airport, uh, you can take a look at safety incidents associated with that airport. And you can have your crews. It's not uncommon. It's a challenge at 135 for both crew members to be operating for the first time to a new field. And the way it goes, it's usually at night, Minnesota, for snow in the forecast, not a short runway. And so we're very happy to have uh, this new pool of information with Asias. You mentioned Asias. How many people in here know what Asias is? So I would expect most hands to, to raise, and some of them, some don't. So just uh, 30 seconds, what's Asias? Well, uh, as I said, we're brand new to it, but it is uh, previously a 121 thing. And uh, with, uh, it's a collection, basically, of reports. It can be flight data monitoring, can be ASAP. Uh, we're probably most interested in the ASAP portion of that. And uh, it's available uh, for nationwide operations. Yeah, so it's a, an FAA program that's run by MITRE, I think. I might have, MITRE that, Corporation. Might have that some, not exactly right, but it's basically a, a system where, where data can be pooled in a de-identified form and uh, you can see what the trends are happening, what trends are happening out there within the national airspace. I know, I know a little something about ASIAS because there's some gentlemen over there that got me involved with it years ago with the, my previous employer. And I will tell you the neat thing about it is not only when you get in the program you have access to the ASAP data, you also have access to the FOQA data because those databases are all built from both of those mm -hmm. reporting systems. So you can learn a lot about what's going on with people's FOQA program if you don't have a flight data monitoring program. What's also really interesting with ASIAS is when you go to say, well, here's, here's how we're trending. And, okay, how well are you doing? Well, we're doing quite well because we are this or we're that. Well, how do you base that? Well, it's based on the national database that we're, we're mm -hmm. calling from, and it gives it validity. So if there are people that want to know more information about it, I guess they could go to... I don't know, Pat. Do you have any thoughts about where people could get information on Osias? FAA.gov. Okay, FAA.gov. But that's a huge <laughs> web page, and so uh, it's probably hard. is it hard to find there? Can you yes. just Google uh, what is it? Aviation AS Aviation System. It, it's hard to dig in. You have to almost have the secret handshake. Yeah, to, you can't and, find it. So you, the best way is to work with someone who's in it. I bet you Jeff can tell us another place to get a little closer. Oh, there he is. Asias.arrow, right? 
Asias. 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 Dot arrow. Okay, good. Thanks. So we've got about uh, two minutes here, two or three minutes. John, I understand that you may have, and, and I hope I've got this right, I understand you might have a real-world example of SMS being able to identify and mitigate a significant hazard. Uh, well, one recent example that we had from our system, uh, after the accidents in uh, Oroville, California, and the Earnhardt accident last year, uh, our pilots were discussing egress from the airplanes in a ground incident and also uh, potentially of ingress uh, for emergency crews. Uh, on our Challenger 350 fleet, uh, we have five of those, uh, four, soon to be five, and uh, I, our procedure was to lock the cargo door. Uh, that's uh, actually called for in the Bombardier manuals. Uh, and uh, people started to question that a little bit. Uh, so what do you do? Uh, you know, there were strong opinions both sides, lock it or leave it unlocked. And uh, we decided to run it through the safety system. As part of that process, we contacted the manufacturer. And one of the things that was interesting, the manufacturer's guidance varied a bit, and it showed, uh, some of the documents showed it as an emergency ingress point, which wouldn't be possible with it locked. Uh, so, uh, after some discussion with them, uh, they came back legal and said, uh, you know, that door should absolutely be unlocked in the flight. Uh, and uh, so, we came back and changed the, our procedures, now that door is always unlocked. And so, uh, and uh, Bombardier actually came back and said, uh, we're going to change our manuals. Wow. And so that's a, just a good indication of the safety system having some external effects beyond our own company. Great. We've got about a half minute. Any other real world examples? And I know that there are lots of examples out there. Go right ahead, sir. Ken? One, one of the things we try to do is uh, look at accident reports or incident reports from other companies and learn their lessons because that's the cheapest lesson to learn. And uh, after the uh, Air France accident uh, over the Atlantic, we put in uh, procedures in our SOPs that uh, pilots are not allowed to leave the cockpit at certain points in flight, period. Fantastic. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a break. Don't leave quite yet. Just so you know, at uh, 4 o'clock or thereabouts, we will call for questions. We'll get questions live from the audience plus uh, questions submitted um, from the web. And Sean, that email address for the questions, maybe we can show it during the break would be? Safety advocacy at NTSB.com. <laughs> Why do we make up these long names? <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right, safety advocacy at NTSB.gov. Is that right? Okay. All right, so anyway, we'll take questions live at four, plus questions on the, on the, uh, on the web. Let's come back at 225 and we will resume talking about flight data monitoring. Thank you very much. Okay. So let's let's uh, get going with uh, flight data monitoring. I I didn't realize how quickly 15 minutes could go by. But uh, here we are. Guys, I think everything's going, going great. Let's just keep doing what we're doing. Again, I look forward to getting the uh, questions from the audience. We've got 52 people online. Jim Schultz is uh, watching from Fredericksburg, uh, Texas. It's good to have a lot of people here uh, and, and a lot of folks online. Um, you know, we're, on this panel, we're going to talk about, uh, for about 20 minutes, we're going to talk about flight data monitoring. And, and I think that Sean really hit on this, that when we talk about flight data monitoring, we're not necessarily talking a full up focal program. I worked for a Part 121 carrier. In addition to my <coughs> flying duties, I also worked in our focal office. So we're not really talking necessarily about a full up program a full-up focal program. So I want to hear some of the innovative ways that, uh, that our panelists are conducting some level of flight data monitoring. So who on this panel uh, is, is doing some level of flight data monitoring? So we've got 
We've got with that external or onboard aircraft. Um, in, in any form or fashion. So okay, so we've got raise your hands. We've got okay. We've got almost almost everybody is doing some level of flight data monitoring. Now, Ken, as I understand it, you're in the early stages of FDM. How did you get started? What motivated you to do that? Well, again, quite frankly, uh, for EU operations, you have to have some sort of flight data monitoring. For European operations, yeah. to go into the EU, yeah. you have to have some yeah. level of FDM. Yeah, EAS is requiring it. Okay. All right. But um, there is, there's real value there. I mean, again, it's something they're making us do, but there's real value, and, and, and we're seeing that already, even though we're at the early stages of it. All right, you're seeing the value. I appreciate you saying that there is value. Tell us some of what uh, some some of the value that you are seeing. Well, I think one of the ways to sell it to uh, aircraft owners or operators is uh, from a maintenance standpoint. Uh, we see that uh, if crews are putting out flaps at the maximum speeds all the time, you're going to put a lot more wear and tear on it. Uh, you know, how, how uh, descent rates on, on touchdown. Uh, there's definitely savings there. And then also just making sure that the SOPs are being followed, that we, we've caught a few little problems where, uh, where guys aren't putting the gear down or the flaps at the appropriate point in the approaches. So if you're dealing with that level of sophistication, you're not doing it with just a GPS no, on, no. A, on a Pario or something. Tell us about what you're doing. We have the QARs in all the airplanes, and we uh, contract with, the, I can't remember the name of the company now, uh, but we contract with a company that uh, analyzes the, you know, they put the data together for us, and then we have to analyze it. Fantastic. Gary, uh, so tell so us the, what the you're doing. The data collection for us now is an after the fact or outside the aircraft. An interesting exchange took place with our FAA representatives recently when they were querying us and they were using flightplan.com in order to plot the aircraft. We thought, well, they would be using their data, we'd have to scavenge. That and listening to the commercially available <laughs> ATC transmissions and data that we get from maintenance if it's related. So it's that compilation of data after the fact. Um, some of our long-haul aircraft are focal capable, uh, and but we are not actively monitoring that other than for the maintenance aspect. The newer products for FDM are most interesting to us, and we are exploring those, particularly those that now use video monitoring of the flight deck. But in that, it's when we've canvassed our crews, what do you think of the idea of a video camera on the flight deck? Oh, no way. <laughs> and then you ask them, uh, how often do you realize you have a CVR running the whole time? <laughs> yeah, so we're getting there. Fantastic. So who, who, uh, who raised your hand? Of those who raised the hand, raised your hand. How many of of you are doing it without a quick access recorder, just through some other means? Jeff. Yeah, our, our director of operations and chief pilot, they're always watching what's going on through the either flightplan.com or other ways of looking at it. And, uh, you know, you, you, I, I'm still a check airman in our 135 operation. So we can go out, we can give check rides, and you can tell what the pilots do, and you can get a good idea on how well they, they follow standard operating procedures by how smooth they are in, in doing that. But you don't know what they're really doing on the trip. So we're always kind of snooping around and, and watching. <laughs> Now, Janine, apparently you're not uh, doing FDM at this point. Uh, so what impediments might an organization, a smaller organization, face? What impediments are there to, to FDM? I think one is, what do you do with all the data once you get it back? So obviously the, the new aircraft, they all have the download capability. We could, we could pull it. We pull maintenance stuff all the time. So it's in there. Um, aircraft are programmed for it. Um, but what do you do with all of that? And there's so many outstanding factors, I think, that for 135 operators, that's different than maybe data that was collected for, for 121 operations. When, when they started really collecting a lot of data for, for 121, you know, there was, there was fuel rates that they were collecting, they were collecting touchdown zone, they were collecting a lot of different things like that, but if you land in the first third of a 10,000 foot runway, who cares? You land in the first third of a 5,000 foot runway, we have a problem. So, I can see some pieces would be nice to have. On our flight school side, we, we do put GoPros on board. You say, you know, you don't want a, a video camera in the cockpit, and everybody's like, no, but you say, hey, you want GoPro on board? They're like, yeah, you know? <laughs> 
I want, you know, they don't realize, but I mean, so <laughs> the newer generation wants to show you everything they're doing. So, oh, yeah. um, but it's, it's, it's what to do with all that data once you have it. And again, we don't go to the same airports. We don't fly the same approach. The weather isn't the same. It's, so even if you have all this, you're going to have so many outliers that it's all going to look weird from a 135 perspective, at least from the type of operations that we do. Thank you very much. Nick Sabatini, when he was at the FAA, I heard him say that, that data is the lifeblood of, FM, of, of SMS. Um, so my question is, can you, can you have an effective SMS program without flight data monitoring? Love to hear from the panel. I think you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, any well-constructed SMS program is going to help. Okay. Anybody willing to talk about safety? I don't have to have the data recorder in, on board the airplane to tell me that, hey, they went missed off of this approach or they got wind shear alerts. I, I don't need to see the FDM for that. But if the pilots are open to talking about their experiences, then you'll get you'll get the information. So it's the open reporting, really. That's the that's the first FDM. Data it really point. is. Right. Even though we're all talking about electronics and so mm -hmm. forth. Mm -hmm. Right. So. The ones that aren't talking, those are the ones that have to be caught by the FDM. But then there's the just culture, right? Now we can't get rid of them, even right. though we caught them. Yeah. yeah. So Todd, <laughs> oh, go, go ahead. Go well, ahead. <laughs> even within conventional SMS, we've tried to capture some of the FDM data points uh, using safety performance indicators, where there's self-reported over speeds on flaps or uh, F FMS misprogramming events, uh, it's clumsy. Uh, we re it really hasn't worked. Uh, we tried, and it just, uh, you have to go through sort of standard hazard reporting just to make these quick and dirty entries, and uh, it, it just hasn't worked for us. I understand, thanks. Now, Todd, uh, walk us through the evolution of flight data monitoring uh, with FlexJet. So our program started um, a number of years back with, um, like Ken, large cabin aircraft um, where it's required into EASA operations um, while realizing at the same time the value of the program. And, um, you know, in, in SMS, a FDM is a, a component of SMS, right? It's not all of SMS, it's a component of it just as ASAP is. You mentioned the, the pilot reporting or employee reporting side of it. That's another component that, in my mind, the FDM kind of completes the process of SMS on the flight operation side. Um, our, our program has expanded um, beyond the large cabin aircraft into every aircraft in our fleet. Um, the large cabin aircraft uh, originally had the uh, plug and play uh, QAR where they needed to be downloaded with a unit. Um, we've transitioned into wireless QARs um, with near real-time monitoring uh, of data. So one of the things that you mentioned is challenging is in the beginning, what do you do with all that data? And that, that, that's, a real, that's a real concern and, it, and it's valid. Um, the one thing that we did was kind of take a step back and, and start with just a few items, right? You may have all this data, what do you do with it? Start with just a few items that you might be able to, to handle and manage, and then let it expand into all the trigger points that a FDR may record. So what benefits have you found from, uh, from, from the flight data monitoring program? Great question. Um, you know, if you see an event that occurs, you're able to immediately address it and do something with it, just as you would with, a, with an employee report, right, that comes in. You, you address it right away, and you, you take what you learn from that and, and be proactive with it. And I think that's the, the biggest benefit into any, any operation. Thank you, Todd. Who can give us a, a specific example of how a flight data monitoring program has uh, helped to find something that you didn't like and something that you were able to do something with. Uh, one area we've seen is uh, we, their pilots were getting a little sloppy on speeds on approaches. And uh, 
I know guys still fly periodically, and I know I've been much more careful about maintaining the proper speed and not saying, well, I'll bleed it off later. And uh, I think we're, we're seeing a little bit of that now. The crew. Great. Other examples? I just have a, I have a question. Um, one of the, I think, setbacks to not, one of the things that I see for not doing the flight data monitoring is then you're creating that culture where, well, they're going to see it anyways. I don't need to tell them about it because it's going to be caught, right? They're looking for the outliers. So now the pilots aren't giving us the information again. They're not talking about what's going on in the cockpit because, well, Big Brother's watching. They're going to see it. So that's the other portion of it because we've seen that from the, from the reaction from the flight school of the GoPro is now we've seen stuff. We're catching it on video, but they're not telling us about it now. Now we're having to actually really go and dig for it. And then there's the group, though, that it can be used if it's he said, she said sort of situation mm -hmm. where the accusation is made, there's an investigation. Now you've got, you say, well, look here, see what we have. I don't know if that's a majority or minority example. Mm -hmm. I think what you're concerned about is valid. So we've talked about the impediments. Uh, not all aircraft are certainly equipped, I guess. Uh, Gary, you've got a lot of King Airs in the wheels up operation. I don't know if, if the newer King Airs have. They did come, many of them, with the capability, but the delivery of the data was um, somewhat unreliable. The management of it was ex extreme, so it's been set aside. It's, so it, it provided some, but it was a newer product for us at the time, and we've set it aside but now recognize uh, there are a number of individuals in the organization that are pushing to see this come through. Please, John. Well, uh, just on the challenges front for uh, flight data monitoring, uh, many of the operators are fortunate to own uh, all of their aircraft. We're a management company. Uh, there are other people involved with making the decisions whether to put it on board, and uh, we can be advocates for it, and. We can be passionate advocates for it, but in the end, it doesn't mean uh, that ownership will support it. So uh, that's something else. You know, you want to make it uniform across the fleet if you can. Not always possible. I'm, I'm going to ask one more question, then I'm going to ask Mike to, to jump in there. But, but how can organizations like the FAA or the Air Charter Safety Foundation better enable or assist the development of flight data monitoring programs? I think perhaps one way is by giving a lot of best practices at different levels when you talk about the scalability. How, how can you do it if, you're, if you don't have, if you're not flying golf streams? That's, uh, that's a great, great point there. What else? Endorsement of, of if I, I realize it's a, it's a slippery slope, but endorsement, not necessarily a product, but a, a set of methods. And I hate to say it, but a mandate. Um, well, I know that's that's a, a bad word, but I was going to ask that. I mean, uh, you know, we're, I've just learned uh, that EASA requires it, and I guess that's for, I don't know who that's for. Is that for for part for charter type aircraft or certain aircraft over a certain size? Uh, what's the mandate in in, uh, in Europe? Yeah, France um, is is a, a, a requirement to operate there. Your aircraft have to be on a program. I believe it's nine or ten seats or more. Um, so it has to be on a program. Um, you know, one of the one of the the challenges, um, you know, in the beginning is 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 getting that buy-in, right? Is the ownership, and that's something that you have to work through. But I think if you work through a cost-benefit analysis, you'll you'll get to the point of, you know, well beyond the initial pilot objections of you know Big Brother's watching type thing to you know, the improvements and streamlines and maintenance and fuel savings. And I'll talk about this tomorrow in a presentation. Um, one of the examples that, that, we, um, that, that we went through and we learned from and, and made it a proactive event and shared with um, our pilots and our pilot training. Um, but the efficiencies of the overall organization is, is, is real. And, and when you realize that, I think you know, that's when you when you, you can start getting the buy-in. And, you know, talking about mandated, that mandating, that's one of the things that we've called for, is for the, um, 
the mandating of, uh, of uh, flight data monitoring for Part 135 operations. So, uh, you know, nobody likes mandates, but, uh, but we, want to, we do think there should be a, a level playing field, and you've got some operators that have these programs and some that don't. Mike, I apologize for uh, hogging the time, but uh, she's all yours. Well, Robert, on, on your mandate there, one, one of the questions I think a lot of people have is what is flight data monitoring? Because it can take many different forms. And I think if, if the industry thinks that you're going to have to put some very expensive equipment in that's going to be watching every move that the crew is making, you're going to have a lot of kickback to it. And how do you, again, scale it down to the small operator that perhaps is flying the float planes in Alaska or the Cirruses all over hypersonic? That's a great point, Jeff. Thank you very yeah, much. That's exactly where I was going to go. You know, uh, for the, I was being a former operator myself. Um, I couldn't figure out how to do it on a lot of the aircraft I had, and resources were one of them. You know, if you have a full up FOQA program with gatekeepers and bringing people in, wait in the aircraft, or are any of you run into that issue? The cost, the weight, the technology? Sure, sure. yeah. Okay. The Just, idea of universalizing it, perhaps, <laughs> this is not a new idea, obviously, but ACSF, for example. So we have our unit, our little unit that we buy, and it's all funneled to ACSF. They set up the processing and distribute back information. So some sort of central to the point of sharing data, because that's ultimately the purpose of this. Well, I'm aware of that group. I think they've yeah. been looking at that for quite a while. I know <laughs> well, I was when I was there. <laughs> but uh, we we're trying to figure out how to do that, just like the ASAP program right. that we'll talk about here in a little while. So um, Janine, you had talked about um, you know, if we have this uh, flight data monitoring program, then why do people want to report this stuff? Mm -hmm. um, I think the big thing of this now, and I, I might be wrong, but I think Asias is trying to do this now, is trying to tie the FOQA data, the data monitoring uh, that they're seeing where there's exceedances with the ASAP report from the crew as to why did we exceed this. Mm -hmm. So I think that's an important thing. So of any of you that have the uh, uh, flight data monitoring, do you share your data, de-identified de data with Asias? Yeah, we do. Are you seeing any benefits from it? We do, and, and to your point, you can go in and you, you can look at areas of um, you know, the, the world where you may have never been, or you know, you're doing an airport review and you wanna see what issues that airport may have. And you know, realizing that it may not be pilots, right? It may be air traffic control. It may be environmental things that are influencing issues and hazards. And I think really the biggest the biggest realization is when you realize that you've now know, made hazards now known with an FDM program. That's what allows me to sleep at night is being making those hazards now known. And when you can do that, you can manage them. Anybody else want to add to that? Well, I would just like to say like, so the manufacturers have all this ability to download all this data but why does it have to come from 135? But there's 91 operators operate the exact same aircraft. We're flying in the same airspace. We're following the same approaches. We have the same MDAs for the most part, right? So, and now everything has ads B. So all this data is out there. Why is it just not public knowledge to share? Because obviously if it just shows that everybody operating you know, Challenger 350s or Phenom 300s is always going below uh, you know, an MDA, then we can just say this is a known thing. It doesn't have to be specific for my organization. I mean, every crash is caused because it impacts the ground. Okay, so in, if we go back and look at all the anticipated accidents, they went below the MDA, they weren't on speed. Okay, well, great, that's what the FDM shows. Well, it's not just 135 operators, it's not just 121, it's, it's everybody. So the airplane's already making the information, just share it freely. It shouldn't be mandated that 135 now has to do it because everybody's still crashing airplanes. That's true, and I, I know there's a lot. Not every manufacturer is getting all that data or has the ability to do that. But again, Coming, a couple points. Yeah, and I know a lot of the ASIA stuff is based off of legal memorandum of understanding, so you can't share everybody's data with everybody, unfortunately. Can I but, ask a question about that? I know we're out of time on this particular su subject, but... Uh, Peter Korn, does uh, MBAA, do they share, is there an arrangement with the uh, MBAA to share Part 91 data? Does anybody know? I don't see Peter. Yeah, they yeah. are part of the General Aviation Information Analysis Team, which does include 135. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. 
Yeah. yeah. We're, we're not process-wise and he's not directly involved. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Well, we're out of time, so. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll move on here. Um, so uh, what we're going to talk about now is some of the unique aspects of 135 operations. And I know we've uh, already discussed some of these already, but um, um, what are the unique challenges when it comes to uh, uh, on-demand charter operations? You know, the training, the airport environment, uh, schedules, things like that. Um, Jeff, <laughs> what, I, I know you have something to say about this. <laughs> Well, it's, it's a whole different world than the 121. And, you know, so many times the pilot himself is making all the decisions. Uh, I always laugh about some of our 121 uh, um, people that have small airplanes will come in and ask, you know, hey, how does this flight plan look? Is this, you know, you see any problems with this? Because they don't even know how to flight plan because everything's done for them. Where, as in the uh, 135 world, many times the pilot or the crew is going out making all the decisions. Plus, things change all the time. It's not unusual to be on a flight and somebody say, hey, can we do this? Oh, yes, we can, which is going to a different airport because something has changed. And so you're going into many different airports, many different types of airplanes, um, many different conditions. It's, it's just, there's so many variables in the 135 world, it's, it's amazing. Very good. Janine, do you have any more to add on that? I know you already gave, gave us some earlier. Well, I, I think it's interesting. I was looking at statistics before this panel and, um, there's 121 and there's their scheduled, but then 121 occasionally does on demand, correct? And their statistics changed significantly when they suddenly did on demand um, and filled that kind of void because they're not flying between Denver and Chicago. They don't have an ILS that lines up into the wind every single time. And they also don't deal with you know, the Cessna that's on final in front of them us slowing down our approach speed, right? It's the Cessna that goes around so that the air carrier can land behind and the air carriers land at the tower at airports. Um, it's interesting to me, all the statistics for all the hours flown for 135, because I asked you know, a couple of my pilots, I was like, how do they know who's 135? We all know who's 121 out there, but how do you know when I, when I land that I'm 135? Nobody knows, and even the NTSB statistics says that it's based on the, uh, the tower operations, right? Tower counts, tower doesn't know if I'm 135 or not, and even if he is counting, the 5,000 airports that we go to do not have control towers most of the time. They don't have grooved runways where the ice is flowing off of it. We don't have all the de-ice equipment. And so I think, um, you know, as far as from a, the differences, it's just apples to oranges as far as what we're doing out there and the airports that we're going and what we're doing. Very good. Yeah, there's always that comparison out there, you know. I think we've even said that a few times about... Uh, you know, why isn't 135 like 121? You know, why can't 135 be like 121? Anybody have any comments on that? Ken? Well, I was fortunate when I started my, my, the executive flight ways 30 years ago, uh, the owner of the company was an American captain who started the company when he was furloughed. He was an Air Force uh, commander, and he tried to structure the company along 121 lines. And consequently, we had to develop really strong SOPs, operating manuals, and uh, try to really hold people to you know, strict conduct in, in the cockpit. But as Janine said, it's really difficult now. The, the hiring situation is really difficult. Uh, you know, when, when I started with the company, we had, you know, for one position, you'd have 100 resumes. Now for... Uh, you know, uh, one position, I, I'm, I'm shutting down an airplane because I can't crew it. And it's uh, the quality of the pilots we're seeing now is uh, sometimes suspect. And that's the major challenge for us right now. John, you got anything to add to this? Well, uh, it, those are all good points. Uh, on the pilot hiring side, I would just, just second what Ken is saying. We've had a lot of trouble with that. Uh, and we've shifted from a sweet spot of a pilot with three to 4,000 hours roughly to a situation where we're hiring retired 121 guys that are pilots that are still at the top of their game. And, uh, you know, we got five, seven years, 10 years. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then junior pilots now that are maybe 1,500 hours where we would have never done that in the past. And that mix seems to work. Uh, but it, it's it's a challenge. 
a lot of new people and that makes everything harder. SMS just takes a while to establish the trust to have a good SMS culture and there's been a lot of turnover. Understood. Thank you. Uh, Todd and Gary. Well, the duty time issue is another one. Yeah. Obviously, charter is very competitive. It's in the nature of its title, on demand. And so how do you do that? You maximize what you have. Now you have to do it even more because you cannot crew all the airplanes, perhaps, at times. So now you're at the maximums allowed, 14 and 10. Maybe not always just 10 hours off duty in a classic sense, but certainly legally. So now a series of changes take place, the nature of what we do, and the error rate starts to escalate because fatigue is now playing a role. And we all strive to find alternatives. We can get them on paper, <coughs> but we still drive that 14 and 10 because that's how we can deliver the product with what we have. And I see that, I think we all do, as a great challenge uh, because the human body is going to collapse at some point. And the reporting dictates that. Sometimes it's an excuse, obviously. But if you dig deep enough, you can often see the trend where fatigue is a significant. Fatigue, rushing, distraction. So. Thank you. Todd, are, are you yeah. guys trying to strive to be like a 121 operator? Are the, are the rules and regs driving us towards that? I, I don't know if I would put it in a sense like that because like um, everyone said, it's, it's an apples to oranges comparison. And there's a lot of valid points here that are, that are real. Um, you know, in 121, uh, it, when I flew airlines, it, it was, you know, fairly controlled every day. You know, you get a dispatch uh, release and you, you get your flight plan, you get your weight and balance, although you add the bags and the passengers and that's it. Submit it uh, through the gate agent and it's, you know, off you go um, to an airport that you've been to 200 times. And in fact, you know, you, you probably memorize the frequencies on the way there. Um, in 135, it's, it's a much more complex environment in the sense of, um, you know, let me give you an example. We have, I would suggest most airlines on average operate somewhere around the range of 200 airports that, they, that they've likely done risk assessments on. Fairly complex, right? You, you need a pretty involved infrastructure to operate at a, at a gateway or a base, outstation, if you will. In the 135 world, we look at airport reviews almost every day. New airports that come to us through our, our clientele, we may have never been to. Even as long as we've been operating for you know, over 20 years, it's, it's almost a daily um, you know, request to go into an airport that's away from the major cities you know, that they can get into and out of much quicker and easier. So it's amazing to me that we have over 4,000 some airports in our system, but there's still many that we haven't been to before. So that's, that's just an example that I can think of that, you know, it's complex and, you know, just when you think you've, you've done it, every day is new. Anybody have anything to add to that? Well, John? those airports keep changing also. <laughs> and, you know, you may have a good operator there one day and the next day there's nobody there when you fly in and uh, you, you're always checking and, and checking on, uh, the, the runway conditions and, and what the services that are available. And it's, it's, it, every day it's something new. If so. there's somebody to talk to there. Right? Okay. Yeah. If there is somebody to talk to. John, yes. you were going to say yeah. something. Well, I might just add that there's always a push to use the smaller airport, the one that's closer to the meeting, yeah. that's downtown, or is rural and closer to wherever, wherever the final destination is, there's a push. And not that uh, you're asked to do anything unsafe. It's just that there's always a push to reduce the margins. And we're using eligible on-demand operations, an 80% safety factor versus a more conservative 60% uh, safety factor, I would say more often. And uh, that's, uh, you know, that's just part of the business of private aviation is saving time and being 15 minutes from the meeting. The convenience of having that aircraft. Right. Right. John just Again? brought up a really interesting point. Uh, you know, the Kobe Bryant accident and all the speculation, what happened? Was there any pressure applied to those pilots to go? And we have the same situation that John had. The, you know, the client wants to go to that, you know, 40, 600 foot runway. And we say, well, you know, we could go uh, 10 minute, 15 minute longer drive. We have a greater margin of safety. No, I want to go there. 
uh, what do you mean we have to have two pilots? Uh, what do you mean, why do we have to have two engines? Why can't we fly a single engine? And it's, uh, it's you know, the economics comes into it very frequently. I can appreciate that yeah. as being with a manufacturer in my <laughs> former life. And uh, yeah, it was always a closing situation and we had to get the customer there or we weren't gonna sell the airplane. The pressure's there. Yeah. Okay. Who else goes international? I know Todd, do you do? Here you do some? Okay, just Europe, or are you Mexico, I'm assuming, Caribbean? Yeah, Europe and, and some in the Pacific and Asia. We've been to Southeast Asia, Russia a few times. Okay, any unique rules and regs uh, other than what's already been brought up here that you have to deal with? Um, well, it's, uh, I would say that uh, the difficulties are more um, uh, flight procedures. Uh, Russia has supposedly shifted from a metric altimetry, but uh, it really hasn't happened in the, uh, you know, the outlier uh, airports. We had a flight to Petropavlovsk last year on the Kamchatka Peninsula, and uh, they were still using metric altimetry, even though the publications were saying, oh no, it's converted in all QNH. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, there are procedural differences that we run across. I can appreciate that. I've, I've flown over there. I've flown in China. I've had the conversion chart up in the cockpit, <laughs> oh, yeah, multiple yeah. copies of it, no. uh, and uh, tried to figure that out. Um, anybody else want anything about international ops well, it, over there? It follows along with what you're saying. A classic my example is here in the United States, we declare an alternate. We may not even use that alternate. If you're operating outside the United States, you not only have to declare your alternate, you have to project the flight path you're gonna take, the departure procedure, et cetera. So that's one more element that has to be added. And in our operation, we process a great deal of the international activity through multiple parts of the organization so we don't miss something. Whereas the domestic flight planning, a bit simpler, is generally on the burden is on the flight crew. Great, thank you. I'm gonna pass over to the chairman here in a second, but I always thought it was funny. I, all the times that I had to go to an alternate in the United States, and I had filed an alternate, and I went and missed approach and said, I'm going to my alternate. Every single time I did that, it wasn't a lot in my career. They always said, okay, where do you wanna go? <laughs> Isn't that in front of them? Yeah. I think it is. Chair, Mr. Chairman, yours. Thank you, Mike. So I wanna know if, if um, why, why there should be different. When I came from a, a 121 environment to start running a 91 environment, um, the company, uh, we didn't have AEDs on the aircraft. And I said, you know, we had AEDs, AEDs, defibrillators, in my airline environment, why would we not want them here? My philosophy is, is that we should be as, when, when somebody stepped on one of our airplanes, there really should not be a significant difference between the level of safety between that and the 121 operations. So what do you think about that idea? When somebody is, especially when somebody is exchanging money for goods and services, now granted in part 91 operation, it was the airplane was owned by the company, so there was no money that was being exchanged. But for part 135 operation, why should there not be, 121 has FDM, 121 has ASAP, 121 has LOSA. Why should it not be the same for part 135? Who wants to take a whack at that one? Well, 121 does not go into 5,000 plus different airports to begin with. Um, 121 ha has resources that many of the charter operators do not have, both in terms of personnel and, and money. But the customer, the person who's hiring that airplane, why do they deserve any lower level of safety than if they were to go on a, on a, on a major carrier? I don't think that they have a lower level of safety. They have an increased risk, which is two entirely different things. Because 135, when you compare it to 121, 121 doesn't do emergency med medevac. They don't do all the air tours. They don't. They're not the last ones before a, a natural disaster occurs. They're not the last ones to pull out. They're not the first ones to go back in to get the supplies and get the airport back up and running for the 121 carriers. So the 135 is kind of like I view it as a special ops of the of the of the operation. 
there is an increased risk, and they know it because the clients, when they step on, they say, why do I need two pilots? Why do I need to go to this alternate? Why do I need this long runway? Why can you only go here when it's dry and not wet? They never get on a Delta flight, go up to the cabin crew and be like, why do we have two pilots up here? Right. Now, the idea of they don't have a different level of safety, they just have increased risk. Mm -hmm. I think that's playing with words there because safety is the management of risk to an acceptable level. So I'm going to say that there is a different level of safety. Well, the answer to that is that there's a different uh, risk in where they go, where they want to go. So 135 could eliminate that risk by eliminating all the places they go and, and make sure they have all that, but you would not have an industry left. I'm but not sure, you, though, because now we get back, dare I say it, to the mandate. So the only way any, a lot of this stuff will work, because it's so competitive, is everybody's got to do it. Because the client who buys our product will still want our product, even if it's at a higher cost. But if there are all these variables, because we have AEDs and you don't, or vice versa, so forth and so on, now there's going to be selection. We're going to lose. You're going to win, and hooray. But if it's mandated, in other words, we have to be told to do it, we all do it, now the playing field is once again level. If I don't know if that's realistic. We're the same aircraft. Uh huh. And, and the in other the thing, you're right, there's obviously problems with it. But. And the, the other problem with that is how many people won't take the trip? I mean, every one of us gets calls every day to do something where they say, now that's too much, I'm not doing it. And then what do they do? Maybe they jump in a but car. But is that and drive. because it's too much for them? Or is it too much measured against the competitor? No, too much for yeah. them. And yeah. they jump in a car and drive, and we all know that that's the most dangerous thing they can do. Right. <laughs> to the well, airport. I, I see both points here, and I do believe that 135 should strive for the same safety standards as 121. Uh, whether we can achieve that is, is problematic because one of the big differences is the airlines have a very stable crew. You go to work for Delta Airlines, you're there for 30 years. You're not going to be there for 10 years and they say, well, you're not going to go try United because you lose your seniority. We're faced with guys who come in and 135, even if you're the best 135 company, for the most part, if somebody offer, from a Fortune 100 or Fortune 500 flight department offers them a job, they're gone. Now I got to replace them. And like I said before, they're, they're, what's the value of the replacements now is, pretty, is getting low. And one of the big problems we have with some of these auditing companies, uh, and not ACSF, because they don't, they don't mandate this, but there are some companies out there that say, we want this minimum flight time for a, for a flight crew. And it's really difficult because they trust me to weed out the bad ones, but they don't trust me to put in the good ones. And there are some guys with 2,000 hours that can fly circles around a guy with 10,000 hours. Here's my premise. There should be an equivalent level of safety. It doesn't mean you have to do exactly the same things. We, we faced this in the airline industry in the early 90s when you would have then called commuter airlines that were code sharing with majors. And one, the commuters at the time were operating under Part 135, as I recall. Mm -hmm. But the majors were under Part 121. So the FAA changed that to where if you were a certain size airplane, you, you had to be part 121. I'm not suggesting everybody needs to be 121, but I am suggesting that there needs to be an equivalent level of safety, however you do that. I think, uh, John, you were going to say something. Uh, well, uh, I don't really foresee any difficulty in getting uh, large cabin, 10 or more airplanes to adopt FDM and make the investments. Uh, I don't know that a flight data recorder is even available for a CJ2 or a King Air, uh, and there may be other ways to satisfy a flight data monitoring requirement, but uh, I think there's, uh, unless it's mandated and new technology is adopted, it's gonna be very difficult for the small airplanes. Thank you. Mike, I'm gonna turn it over to you to go to the next topic, which is, uh, which is ASAP. Okay, something near and dear to my heart. The Aviation Safety Action Program um, I know a lot of these people at the Air Charter Safety Foundation, Safety Symposium has heard me talk on this the last couple of years, but um, everybody here has ASAP, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, for how long? For 12 years. 
12 taught. Uh, 16 years now. I 16. Three. Three. Maybe four ish. Four ish. Whenever, whenever the Air Charter Safety Foundation got a uh, memorandum of understanding with the FAA. years ago, yeah. Six, seven years. Okay. Janine, one. one. Okay. Um, maybe I'll ask this question to these four since it's a little newer over here. How did you get employee buy into it? We, we had a couple of people, uh, in, in uh, particularly in maintenance, that were ex airline and they could speak very highly of it. And uh, we just explained what, how it's a, a benefit to the crews and the mechanics. And we had no problem with the buy-in. Yeah, it's, an, it's a no-brainer. Yeah. Okay. Jim? Yeah, same, no trouble. Uh, it, it provides an extra level of protection for both maintenance and for pilots uh, over the NASA program, the okay. NASA ASAP program. Yeah. And once you make that clear, we've got complete buy-in. The bigger problem is getting the FAA to buy in. So you still having issues with the FAA uh, with it? They're very, very slow. Yeah. It took us a year to get an ERC meeting. Yeah. Over. To get the FAA representative there. Right. Yeah, I, I think, uh, Brian, I may be wrong, but we've had, you've had struggles uh, with certain FISDOs. <clears throat> So the Air Charter Safety Foundation is in about 55 FISDOs in the nation right now. There's 77 in the country, right? So Russ, my partner Russ Lawton can probably talk about this a little bit better than I, but when it comes to any kind of team building, relationship, collaborative effort with the FAA, um, you have the best of the best and you got other locations that you know are a little bit more challenging. And so similar to your own flight departments, when it comes to old school, new school, and the young guys that are typically working for an FAA or your, your employees, anyways, will get it a lot sooner. The older folks in, a, in any particular location is a little bit more challenging. So there, there are those isolated locations that we have to coach through, and we typically, if we have issues, we'll bring in um, a gentleman that really runs the entire ASAP program throughout the nation, a guy named Randy McDonald, who really helps us mitigate and, and manage these locations. Thank you, thank you, Brian, and I apologize for those online. I don't think you, you know, I, they couldn't slide the camera over that way. So for everybody who has an ASAP program, um, has it led to any meaningful improvements in your operation? Absolutely. Definitely. Please jump in. Yeah. The, the best part is that you can have all the safety committees in the world of different ilk, but the ERC is probably the most effective safety committee in an organization, particularly if your organization is capable of sustaining one that meets regularly. Because you now have participation with the regulator. And it's a session to brainstorm where it once was just a cataloging of information, then it became disciplinary. Now it's moving happily to a place where, all right, what are we going to do together? And then you build up this trust so the regulator now wants to join your team. You're not just answering to them. So, which is unique with, with that, because there are other challenges working with the regulator. But for us, I think the barometer of how effective it is, is that the vast majority of reports are sole source. So there is no investigation from the FAA. It is recognition by the particip single participants. Then they report it. And so as a safety tool, as safety promotion goes, it's gigantic for us. Yeah, that's exactly right. And if, if you want to truly measure the health of your safety program, take a look at the sole source reports. Mm -hmm. The percentage that comes in without the, the FAA or the company even knowing about that you wouldn't otherwise know about, that really is a good insight to the, the reporting the health and the just culture within your company. Um, our, our program has made tremendous changes um, throughout our entire organization, um, almost in every department really, um, through manual changes, uh, policy changes, checklist changes, um, recommendations, point of emphasis items in training, um, areas to focus on for the check pilots when they're flying um, with, with um, pilots on the road. Um, and same thing really for mechanics, um, you know, who also have a certificate to protect. Um, we, we've made so many uh, 
uh, AMM or maintenance manual changes um, with the manufacturer while they um, work with us to make those uh, changes and improvements. So it, it's, it's one of the best programs um, out there. John, how about you? How about your program? Uh, well, we've only had it a few years, uh, but we're very happy with it. And uh, we've had a, you know, a few just concrete examples. Uh, we had a report that came in. One crew was assigned a 010 heading, and many people in the audience will be aware, will be familiar with this, but they turned to a 100 heading, which is one of the most commonly missed instructions. And, uh, and just following up what Gary said, uh, the buy-in from the regulator, uh, our POI said, you know, we're going to go to NorCal and talk to them about this and Oakland Center. And there was a concrete change. We haven't gotten a 010 heading <laughs> in a year and a half since this report was made. And, uh, and so I, I think that it's, it's very valuable in terms of you know, external outputs. Very good. Yeah. It also, too, if I may, it, when you're preparing for an ERC, you do a depth of research you might not normally do. And so you're data mining even greater volumes of information that can be disseminated accordingly. I think the mere presence of the ASAP program within our company raised the, the level of safety, the awareness of safety, and improved the culture because people knew that they could disclose. Very good. So did it increase your, when you first implemented, did it increase your reporting at all? How about for the person here who's had it for one year, Janine? We have we've had one ASAP file by okay. a crew. And, um, I mean, it was, it was great. Like you said, you, you look for all the data um, before you go to the ERC and you, you figure out, well, okay, did something weird happen here? And um, I mean, both crew members were very happy that we had it in place. And, I just got asked why it doesn't apply to 91. Right, big one. They're, again, flying the well, same airplanes in the same airspace. That's a very good point. I know most of my operation in my prior life was 91, mm -hmm. and it was great. Um, so you're not protected if you're 91. But. Well, you yeah, yeah. Be. No, you are. Yeah. You are. No, I know. I'm saying yeah. that's the mentality out there. Yeah, that's true. And, and I know I increased my reporting by almost four times the number of reports I came in. So, and what I was getting was significant. Now, you have an SMS, you got to do a safety risk profile, right? And I always tell people that those training things that come out of ASAP or the FOQA in some cases, you know, something significant like that, that's one of your safety risk profile things you need to address at that point. So, um, are you guys using it for that? It's it, that, and it's also particularly strong to satisfy your safety assurance. You don't have to reinvent the wheel to drive safety assurance. You've got this hard, reliable, verified sets of data that you can say, okay, we're going up, we're going down, what are we doing? It also drives a corrective action program, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So for the smaller operators, what was the most significant thing you had to do to get this implemented? And I, I know what my issues were when I did it, but how about you? It mm -hmm. wasn't difficult. Um, we've got one of the best FISDOs, I think, in the country up there in Helena, Montana. And um, I told him that we were interested in, in putting this in place. And he said, okay, tell me what I need to do. So from our standpoint, it was, it was easy. And, and they're very safety oriented up there. And they work with us on, on all sorts of issues. So we got the lucky one. Yeah, ours was very easy, too. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not always easy to work with the FAA, but uh, this one was very easy, went through very smoothly. Uh, one of our former charter pilots was one of the guys in there, and, and uh, plus it helped that they had a couple of airlines that they worked with, and so that made a big difference in their approach to it and understanding the ASAP. How about any legal issues? Did your legal have an issue with uh, getting an MOU signed? I know a lot of others have had that issue. No, if you don't ask them, they don't have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> that, that probably wouldn't go over very well with everybody, would it? Yeah, no, I, I, I remember my issues with that when, when they figured out how much money we were going to save and not having legal fees or outside uh, <laughs> you know, attorneys come in to help us out. It, it was a big deal. Not that we had a lot of issues with that. So, um, Mike, Mike, I would just say, that, uh, shout out to Brian and the ACSF team. <laughs> 
that uh, you know it's a little overwhelming thinking about creating your own program. You look at the size of the advisory circular, and uh, but having it all in place with ACSF made it yeah very very manageable. Yeah, and they took care of the training too, which helped a lot. The training, the administration of it. Uh, right. Yeah, it's uh, it. it it did wonders for my far, uh, former program that uh, it, yeah. it helped me get involved because I didn't have the resources, but you know, for a few dollars, they came in and administrated it and everything like that, and it uh, it opened our eyes because we we always thought we knew where all of our highest risk operations were. Well, we learned how to learn a couple things in the process, and our insurance company kindly covered the dollars part of it. Nice, yeah. very nice, very nice. Yeah. Um, Mr. Chairman, do you have a few questions in this? I might have a few, but I might talk, toss it back to you, or we might go into the next panel okay. uh, a little early there. But uh, I think the question is, uh, uh, the Air Charter Safety Foundation, so they've got this, this, this program in place. It's a program that you can basically, uh, it's a fee-based program, I think it is, that uh, depending on the size of your, your fleet, so uh, how many people in here do, how many people in here are, are aware of that program that the Air Charter Safety Foundation offers? So um, yeah, so, so there's a lot of hands that are not raised, and that's why I asked the question that way, because people wouldn't want to ask their, raise their hand if they weren't familiar with it. <laughs> so who wants to take a, uh, who wants to talk just a little bit about uh, how the Air Charter Safety Foundation, what they offer in terms of, uh, setting up an ASAP program. Is that how you, you're operating, Janine, or did yeah. you just set up? Go ahead and uh, talk about what they're doing. I just emailed Brian. And I was like, <laughs> I, I'm serious, it's that simple. I emailed him and I said, I heard that through the grapevine, maybe, possibly, you know, feel him out through the email that we could be part of this ASAP program. He said, absolutely, here's the paperwork, this is what you need to do. This is, uh, this is some information that I need from you. And a month later, I had an ASAP program. Wow, that's pretty easy. Yep. And, and, and what does that cost to be at your level with a, a small, relatively small operation? Um, I, I don't remember what the, I don't remember what the fee is. Yeah. Well, just uh, what's it cost? So it's a range, yeah. So, so cost associated with uh, joining the ASAP program is based on number of employees enrolled coupled with uh, size of the fleet of aircraft, mm -hmm. right? So you can, entry level guy in, in literally, we can get you, and you have to be a member of the Air Charter Safety Foundation in order to uh, participate in the program. But the small guys under six, and we have many, six uh, employees, one or two aircraft, a thousand bucks will get you in membership and the ASAP program. You start getting in, so it's a tiered approach, right? So the, Per year, yeah, per year. And then it can go from 1000 bucks to $2,500 a year to $5,000 a year. And again, it's all driven on fleet and number of employees. Thanks, and, and I want to make, sure, make it clear we're not endorsing that program, but it is a way that a small operator or even a larger operator can get an ASAP program uh, without having to worry about a lot of the administrative aspects. I think, Jeff, were you going to say something? I saw a hand. Yeah, the, yeah. well, Brian gets a, the big nod on this, but Russ Lawton is the guru on this program, and he's the one that really makes it all work. And, and when you talk about easy, uh, and when things come up, Russ is the man. So I'll endorse that. Great, thanks. <laughs> what else do we want to say about ASAP? Mike, can I, can I add something? Who in here has an ASAP program? Now hold your hand up and keep it up, OK? Now, out of those ASAP programs, who here shares their de-identified data with ASIAS? Mm, a few went down. I don't know, thank you. I, I would highly recommend that you do that because it opened my eyes up a few years ago in my previous operation that I was able to, you know, when you start getting these things coming in, these reports, and you start seeing trends, you start freaking out a little bit because you're like, ooh, what's going on here? Are we doing something wrong? You know, maybe you see a trend, you think, are we doing something wrong? That program, you can go in there and look at that data, and sometimes it'll,
just affirm to you that you're not the only one having the same issue, okay? That's very helpful. And I know I was able to look at some of the FOQA data that was coming out and let me know that, hey, I think the biggest hits a few years ago were a uh, stabilized approach. And that told me that, hey, there's probably a percentage of my own operations where we're having unstabilized approach. And I just don't know it because I don't have the FOQA data. So we're able to focus on that. So um, highly recommend that. It, it costs you nothing, nothing, okay? And then you can go to the great info shares twice a year and you can learn what's going on out in the world. You can learn what's going on with the air carriers. It's just a wealth of knowledge. Thank you very much. Why don't we go into the last panel uh, before we get to the questions and answers. And this last panel, I'll just read it right here off the floor. <coughs> Biggest concerns affecting part 135 ops and next steps. Um, Jeff, uh, what I was reading about about you is that you were concerned about pilots maintaining manual skills. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Well, <clears throat> it's been mentioned several times up here about the declining quality of the upcoming pilots. Uh, we certainly see it. We have a full flight school as well. And even the flight instructors, they, they, don't, they won't even get their double I. They won't get an MEI. They, they, don't, they don't need it because they have a God-given right to a turbine, right seat of a turbine airplane as soon as they can hit twelve or fifteen hundred hours, and, and the lack of the degree of professionalism, the attitude toward professionalism, is a problem. And fortunately, we we've been able to maintain very high um, experienced pilots for our 135, but we see that as a big problem coming down the road. And plus, many of them are the children of the magenta, and uh, we we just interviewed a flight instructor came out of a very well-known college. Um, and for a, a job as a flight instructor, and our head of our flight school turned off the GPS, and the person could not find his way back. So I do want to talk about the pilot shortage. I read a figure yesterday that the United States Air Force is a thousand fighter pilots short. I'm short, but uh, that's the way I was born. But uh, <laughs> um, and, and trans states, they're saying uh, part of the reason they're shutting down by the end pilot. of the year is because. Uh, because of the pilot shortage, and I've heard some of you say that you're you just had to park a particular uh, fleet type. So, who wants to talk more about how that is affecting? I think you said it very well, Jeff. You you pointed it out pretty well there. One of the things that Trans States, from what we understand, is that it wasn't just the pilot shortage because Trans States had come to us and got a lot of the helicopter guys from our uh, Army base and they paid for their training, their fixed wing training to bring them in, but they didn't have seasoned captains to put the young co-pilots with. They were losing their captains so fast that they couldn't even take these guys that they had paid for their training. In the wow. demands of charter, you, the time element is critical. So we often reflect now on should we have a cadet program or should we have a ab initio, call it what you want. Um, not to make 135 different, 121 each is unique, but what you, the demands that have to happen and the time it takes to make that person sure. quote unquote experienced are, are, are a challenge. So what, what's the answer? The answer is you go get other people. Well now, that, now you've got that churn underway and so forth and so on. So this is a for-profit business, these all are. This could actually bring it down. It could be, so you know, we, we kid around. I saw today that United with coronavirus is parking some of their pilots for their Asian routes, you know, must suddenly, ooh, look, there are some new pilots. <laughs> um, so, but to, to the truth of it, if we have to train, then we have to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. We have to come up with a new way of training so that how do you train so that someone quickly integrates into the demanding environment that is charter? Well, I think in some way it's going to fix itself because for years, uh, it cost a student to get all his ratings, I don't know, eighty, hundred thousand dollars and then they'd go out and they'd fly for a commuter and make $15,000 a year, and they said, what's the point? And uh, we lost a, a large part of the pilot pool. Now they're seeing the, the salaries that are being paid and what the airlines are paying. The kids are going to start looking to fly again, but it's going to be probably three, four years before we get caught up. And during that three or four years, I think there's a tremendous risk for all of us. Yeah, sounds like it. Yeah. 
Janine, uh, one of the questions, one of the things that you've raised uh, previously is a concern with the Pilot Records Improvement Act and the inadequacies there. Uh, talk about that. I, I think the FAA is uh, aspiring to put online the online pilot records database, which has taken longer than, than I think they had expected. So talk about some of the, uh, the challenges associated with PREA. I think the, the biggest thing is that you can't get the information that you actually need, which is the pilot's attitude, right? That's the one. The pil pilot's attitude. The pilot's attitude. It's not in there. Okay, he failed the check ride. Okay, did he retrain? How was he? Fine. But it's the attitude. And I mean, I've seen it from pilots that we've hired and we're no longer working with them. I see their PREA requests come back, you know, eight months later from another 135 operator. And eight months later, I see it come from another 135 operator. And you guys are probably all seeing the same thing. It's the same pilot names over and over that we keep seeing. It's the ones that are still flying out there. Um, but it's, we know what the problem is. We know that why they're not with us. But we can't freely share that information right. because we will be sued. We can't say they did this and they did that. Uh, the PREA gives us that they didn't, they don't have a DUI or they do and or that they don't have a, something on their FAA certificate, but that just means they haven't been caught, right? Or they haven't buried themselves into the ground yet. So we need to stop those pilots. Those are the ones that are descending below the MDAs. Those are the ones that aren't following the SOPs. How do we stop that? How do you keep me from taking a Summit Aviation pilot and passing them on to Flex, or a Flex pilot passing them on to Gamma? Because we're all gonna end up in the same pool. We, we'll all have seen the same pilot but there's nothing out there to protect us from sharing this information, and we can't. In fact, you know, if you, talk, if you have an HR company, they're like, just answer the question whether you would hire them back or not. That's all you can say. No, why? Well, I'm not at liberty to say, you know? That's, that's what we're all coached, so we can't get these pilots off, and that's where it comes back to the flight data monitoring, just culture, right? So now we see it, so we talk to them, and we see it, and we talk to them. And we eventually part ways with them. And then here comes the PREA. What am I supposed to say? So 17 deviations and I get sued. I can't. You have arrived. There you go. <laughs> Drop the mic. Was it me? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. I don't think everybody online could hear that. <laughs> to be clear, that was your that was serious. Right. That was serious. So, I, I don't know. Uh, so Todd, I want to ask you this, and Ken, I want to follow up with you too. Now, we've talked about the pilot shortage. Uh, a concern that I've seen each of you express is the FAA FISDO inspector shortage. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. So let's, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's real. Um, and recently I heard um, through um, AFS 900 and, and headquarters that it's, it's not a matter of if SMS will be a requirement for 135, it's a matter of when. And that when is right around the corner. Um, as we go through um, SMS active conformance, we've, we've realized there's, there's, um, there's been a focus on 121 operators, a heavy focus as it became mandated, um, and rightfully so. Um, I, I can't imagine how the FAA is gonna be ready if, if it's mandated for you know, there might be, what, 200 or 300 121 carriers, if, if that, in the U.S. Um, and, and I, you know, I believe there's over 2,500, 135 operators, so I don't know how the, the staffing will be there for that. So that's a, that's a real concern um, as well. Ken, jump in there. Yeah, uh, I'm fortunate that uh, my POI, PMI, and PAI are three fantastic individuals but they are so overworked, it's pathetic. And I had a PO, not the current POI, but I had a previous POI actually said to me, because I queried him, why do you, you come, you do a base inspection on us every month. You know, you have other operators. He said, honestly, I have too many operators, and there are some that if I go to, I know I can't check the box, and it's, I don't have the time to deal with it. I know if I come here, I can check my box off. And that's a sad state of, of affairs. And one of, the, one of the big pet peeves I have is, you know, we all use 142 uh, training uh, companies. At each 142, there's an FAA uh, uh, inspector who's evaluating their check airmen. 
I still have to run the Czech Airmen's information in front of my POI for their approval. And my POI says they spend almost one day a week just on those approvals. And I said to my POI, have you ever denied one? She said, no. Said, How would I get deny them? The data's there. I can't deny them. So why are we going through that waste of well, time and energy when they should be out in the field talking to operators? And I think everybody here can say the same thing. The quality between FISDOs really varies. And I interview people, and they tell me stories about what's going on in their FISDO, and it makes my hair curl. <laughs> and that's pretty, that's pretty difficult to do these days. But there's, there's no standardization between FISDOs. Yeah, and maybe even within FISDOs sometimes. True. Um, I've been hearing that for, for a long time, not trying to pick on the FAA, but, but that's, that's something, a perennial issue I've heard for 40 years. Yeah. But uh, anyway, um, how about, uh, I'm, I'm hearing that there are some perhaps training, in, training inadequacies for, for FAA inspectors as it relates to SMS and ASAP. Are you all experiencing any of that? A lot of them don't even know what the SMS is, is all about. Uh, they learn as we go. Yeah. Uh, to your excellent point that it, was, it will probably be required, or it will be. It's not a matter of winter. But with the Safety Management System Voluntary Program, um, it's new to everyone. When we first started it, it was back in 2016, and this is not a joke. We were in the room with the FAA, and there was yelling and crying. It was an emotional experience because everybody was just throwing their hands up. And so we, over time, as the FAA has tooled it and perfected it, as the people who use it have started to mold it, it's coming together. But you go to an institution, for example, like Embry-Riddle, absolutely incredible place, we go there every year. But they don't even teach a course on this. And so perhaps developing an education so all of us can effectively deliver SMSVP to our organization would be a big step forward. So is there, in some cases, a punitive culture um, within the FAA regarding Part 135? I don't, I don't see that anymore. Years ago, I'd say yes, but now they, they really consider themselves partners in safety. And, and as long as they feel you're trying to be safe and you've made a mistake, it's okay. As long as you try to fix it, they're happy. I think the kinder and gentler FAA is a very true thing. They're, they're much better. They, they will work with you. <clears throat> the problems we see is they focus on a lot of things that don't uh, impact safety whatsoever. They're much more interested in dotting I's and crossing yes. T's than they are in going to see if you are really operating in a safe manner. And, and that, a lot of that goes back to your earlier question, which is the training on these guys and the experience levels. I do check rides with, with, with uh, the FAA, and they won't even pull an engine on me anymore because they don't know the airplane. And we were recently told by one of the FAA people when we questioned why they're asking for this, they said, we, are, um, are, we regulate by guidance. So whatever comes out of Washington for the flavor of that month is a new thing that you're scrambling to meet. Janine, I want to ask you about this because I think you expressed uh, um, some thoughts on this in the in talking to Adam, Adam or, uh, earlier. Most Part 142 training providers uh, don't conduct scenario-based training. Now, when I was with an airline, I found that to be very beneficial, like a loft or something. Mm -hmm. It's the airports we go into or, or something like that. So w what are the impediments that are preventing uh, scenario-based training for Part 135 operators? I think just the, I mean, it's, it's dumb to do a 299 right after they just came out of a simulator doing a 293 and a 297. Everybody can shoot the ILS approaches into JFK. No clue what a 299 <laughs> and a 293 is, so what is that? So the, 290, the 299 is a line check. that we have. It's a box we have to check to say that we can go from point A to point B. That, that's it. With a, with a check airman or a federal inspector on board who doesn't know the airplane, okay, that rides in the back seat, why we, why we waste money and time to fly between point A and point B. And we're like, oh, you're, you know how to do this. We just came out of a simulator. 
can we not fly from JFK to, I don't know, Teterboro or something like that in the simulator and check that box? And it, it goes back to, to Jeff's point about just, we have all these training centers, these 142s, we can build in scenarios, we can fly into Aspen, we can fly into Telluride, but we're not required to, we have to check the box. We have to do a circle. The circle has to be X amount of degrees to line up on X runway. We have to do a visual approach to this runway, dusk or dawn, no visual approach indicator, and a glide slope, and you have to land on a 10,000 foot runway at JFK. And how many of us have done the ILS to, at Memphis, ILS to runway 27, <laughs> circle to land to 18 right. Mm -hmm. Anybody ever done that one? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Memphis, okay. JFK, and Wichita. Only airports that have the right circle besides Anchorage. Right. <laughs> Kennedy. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Mike, I want to give you time. Uh, uh, she's all yours. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chairman Sumwalt. What are we missing here? We've talked about a lot of stuff here, about a lot of issues in 135 operations. What else? What else should we be doing out there? What else should we be focused on safety-wise? Look, if we could just go back, I'm sorry, sure. but back to the foundation of the training event. We're all using contract training and so forth and sure. so on. Is, again, it's the cost-driven. How can we get the training done as quickly as possible? Because it costs X thousands of dollars, and every day that that pilot is in training, they're not out on the line re revenue producing, although it's all part of the process. So that's where... That's the foundation. That's the place to, to catch the problem. That's where it can be analyzed. That's where it's an observer. And I think we all want to do it, but we're all challenged as profit centers of how to do it and keep it as inexpensive as Absolutely. possible. Absolutely. Thank you. John, you were acted like you were oh, going to say something. Um, well, I, uh, there's been some uh, renewed focus and interest on mentoring programs. Uh, particularly, many of us don't have a formal IOE process. And I think there's really room for mentoring. I, I, there are a lot of new pilots. There are a lot of low time pilots. Uh, I've been flying for 40 years and uh, I never really knew what professionalism meant exactly. But over time you realize that, uh, that fallibility is real and that uh, you know, we're all capable of making mistakes and you need to do everything you can to avoid a major mistake. And that means when you go to the simulator, you ask him for crosswinds at the demonstrated limit in both directions. And that means that when you have a high frat score, you mitigate the risk. And uh, it's, uh, to me, the, I mean, everything is important. ASAP is important, FTM is important, but fundamentally it's the pilots in those cockpits that are flying every day that need to do the right thing. And so I, I would just put an emphasis on mentoring. Mentoring. Yeah. yeah, I'll add to that, Mike. I think, you know, professionalism is a, is a key thing that, that stands out in some of these recent, um, and I say recent, three, the past three to five years and 135 operators that have been fatal is that something that comes out of almost each one of those is, is a lack of professionalism in the cockpit. And I, I don't know if it's because of their, their low time or they're, they're taking unnecessary risk, but some of the flights were even illegal, illegally operated. And you know that frustrates me and it should frustrate every one of us in this room um, because ultimately it's gonna affect all of us. Um, although we've seen a lack of FAA oversight in, in some major operations, such as Boeing and, and um, you know Southwest IG report that was just published, those are. It's amazing to me that that still can happen in this day and age. And and I think really a reflection, if if we were to talk about one of the earlier conversations, we all should learn from those incidents and and take a, a look at it because there's something to be gleaned on. There's something to be learned there. And you know we've kind of realized that we're self-regulating. We're, we're the ones making sure that we are complying. Um, you know, we'll, we'll use a VDR uh, program as a company if we need to. Um, and, and it works very well because you have to come up with a comprehensive fix and our, our FAA will hold us to that. And, and we hold ourselves to that as well. Um, but I think that should be one of the, the focus items is, is professionalism. <clears throat> should we uh, 
go to the audience? Does yeah, that let's sound do good? that. Mike okay. and I have been asking uh, softball questions for, for the whole day. <laughs> now, now it's up for the real uh, clients. Yeah. Yeah. By the they way, the professional listen. issue is something that the NTSB has really uh, been very interested in about wow. 10 years ago because we saw a number of accidents that were just, they just blow your mind. Pinnacle. And Pinnacle 3701, the 4010 Club, and a few others uh, that happened right around that time. So, okay, Mike. Okay, uh, I'm gonna ask the audience and in between questions, I've got a couple that came in online. So let's reach out there. I think what we're gonna do, instead of watching uh, the chairman and I run around trying to give you the microphone, we'll try to repeat your question unless it's more than about a, a sentence or two. So any, any questions for our panel? Comments? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay, the question for those online is uh, basically what role does the insurance uh, company have in uh, helping you progress your SMS program or help pay for safety related equipment or things like that? Gary? Um, we, we, uh, yeah, I know uh, our okay. insurance uh, underwriter gives us a discount because we work with the ACSF and we audit it regularly. So safety can, there is a say, oh, yeah. safety and cost are not mutually exclusive. Absolutely. Yes. The, I know my, my former program that with our SMS certificate that we got certified, we, we got a percentage off our, uh, our rates also. Yeah. John? I would point out that our in, insurer uh, will help us con conduct uh, safety uh, drills, safety scenarios so they'll come in and create an accident scenario to the point of maybe involving law enforcement involving 142 training centers uh, involving the executive assistance of maybe your ownership and uh, they'll help create a realistic scenario to see if your emergency response program is adequate uh, so that's been a great help for us we do it annually with them, actually. Annually? Yeah. Yeah, I know as my former program, we actually had a bursary fund that we could tap into every year and do safety training for our crews and our operations. So I think it's probably a little little more for being a bigger operator. You have well, one thing more. that might be worth knowing sure. is that our insurer recognizes ACSF, and when we attend, they include that was in our claim for reimbursement and their fund for reimbursement is substantial. Now, obviously, it would be proportionate, but they do allocate funds where we can demonstrate that the people who are working the data and getting the message out uh, are getting additional training. So is that true now? I, I hear that the insurance market is a hard market and <laughs> yes. that, uh, that they are, uh, premiums might go up 25 or 30%. So are, are the insurance companies still able to work with you uh, to give you a benefit, uh, some sort of financial benefit of these type of safety programs. Does that still exist? I'm, I'm hearing maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. It depends upon when you're doing your renewal yeah, because all crazy. this stuff came up about a year ago. Right. Mike? Okay, let me uh, read one of these that uh, came to us online. This is from uh, Lori Northcutt with Business Operations for Boeing. I'm wondering if Todd could speak more about just culture and how he sees it as a backbone of SMS. That's a great question. Um, really, I think it, it's a fundamental um, principle within every employee that, that feels a sense of, you know, I can report something without fear of reprisal. And if management and, and every manager or director in the company supports that, you'll have a successful program. And, you know, furthermore, with feedback that employee gets after they report something is just as valuable to them as initially reporting it without that fear of reprisal. So I, I think it starts with the, with the company supporting the, the culture of trust. I think that's the foundation of, of building that program. And it, and it can take years um, to, to build that with new employees coming in, you know, they've experienced, had bad experiences at other, other organizations and 
they may not be as easily you know, convinced that, that they can be trusted. Anybody have anything to add to that about just, just culture? Question right here. Great question. So the question for the online audience is that uh, that uh, uh, many of the programs that we've talked about are are reactive, looking at things that have happened in the past. So how are these operators uh, being predictive or proactive? So I'll turn it over to the panel. Thoughts? Well, I said this before: is uh, we we look for the home run, which is somebody anticipating a potential problem. And to facilitate that, we have uh, safety risk assessments. And uh, we try to come up with you know, two, three new topics every, every year to, uh, to analyze. And even the ones that we are currently uh, have completed, every year they're reviewed. And they look at uh, all the mitigating factors. Has anything changed? Has anything improved? Has anything deteriorated? Do we need to uh, improve the manuals and the systems? And so that's proactive. Also, too, the data is the, the data we gather from the reactive activity becomes the basis for the proactive effort where we can see other things, that ancillary things that will take place. Uh, training typically is the first place to deliver that proactive value from an event or a tangent analysis. And that's where you begin with the people and therefore eliminate the problem moving forward. So you do, I, I think, I don't know if everyone agrees, you almost have to have, the crystal ball is the reporting. And then you can draw from it and mold the future. human factors. You gotta elevate it to the human factor level. Because the altitude deviation is really the issue. It's what's the human factor that drove the mistake. And so that directs accordingly. And that's developing, at least it is for us. Yeah, we are, through our ASAP program is, is probably the heart of uh, being able to take something that you've seen in a reactive environment. Um, we've actually seen, um, you know, so let me take a step back. In the ASAP manager's role, they are responsible for drafting up the items that the ERC may earmark for a newsletter item. And then the ASAP manager will take those, those articles and, and try to write it into the newsletter. We've had employees now, not just pilots, but across uh, the spectrum, now volunteer to write those articles. And so they, they feel like they can take what they've experienced it and be able to share it uh, with their peers. And I think that, that is one step that, that we use. But secondly, when we, we have quarterly safety review board meetings and we'll take those, those SPIs, if you will, the safety performance uh, indicators and we'll, we'll monitor them continuously. And if there's an area that, that we see start spiking, um, we had a takeoff, uh, mis uh, takeoff misconfig in one of our fleets um, six months ago. So we saw a spike in that, so we got ahead of it, and, and what it was causing was unnecessary rejected takeoffs. Um, and it, the indicator in the cockpit is a very, very fine line, so it's hard, even though it may show green, we realized that it, by pilot reporting, is they were saying that it was in the takeoff configuration, but they would get the warning and reject the takeoff. So 
we put out a message to that fleet and the entire pilot fleet uh, to, to give the feedback. And I think that feedback loop is, is a big component of that predictive um, act, uh, you know, reaction to the proactive side of it. Is that rudder trim in the Challenger 300? Yeah. 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 That's an easy one to get. 605, yeah. too. <laughs> <laughs> and we're getting down to manufacturers now, are we? <laughs> I, I can tell you from one of my own program, from the ASAP program, I was going to the General Aviation Information Analysis Team, and we were looking at the uh, Rudy 5, which is now the yeah. Rudy 6 departure out of Teterboro. <laughs> Anybody have altitude deviations there? <laughs> yeah. I, I was sitting there going, oh, we've told every pilot here, our demo crews that are usually going in and out of there, and we're still getting one or two per quarter. I'm like, yeah. what is going on? This is crazy. We've talked about technique. We've talked about everything. And I kept getting that trend in my own ASAP program. And uh, so we put it back upon our engineering flight test group, said, you know, these aircraft, we are busting that altitude. Is there a software issue? Is it a database issue? Whatever it is. And they took it on. They said, okay, no big deal. We'll take it back to our Ironbird, which was where we do our software development for avionics and hydraulics and things like that. And the one pilot that took it on was like, I don't see what the big deal is here. This is crazy. Anybody can level off at that altitude and then take a step to the next one. He, they filmed it the first three times. He busted the altitude three times in a row. And then he started digging into it. And we actually found out that at that low altitude, your capture mode in most of the avionics systems out there has already captured and what a lot of pilots were doing were going to a flight level change all of a sudden after getting off the ground. So they were just negating the capture mode. So they were following the bars and the bars weren't leveling off. So your programs, hopefully, you know, I had the ability to do that where I was at. I don't think everybody could, but it was amazing. And we had the video to back it up and we showed all the pilots. So the feedback is huge in these programs. I know I didn't get buy in my program until I started putting feedback to everybody and communicating what was going on out there as it was de-identified. So nobody knew who was doing what. And everybody was like, oh, well, that happened to me. So big deal. Let me switch over. Uh, I got another question here online here. This is from uh, Todd Weaver, Chief Operating Officer of Magellan Jets. Um, how can we promote SMS and educate the public, public as to the value of having a system in place? And should the SMS or the FDM approach for implemented outside of the 135 world, should it be, I'm sorry, should it be implemented outside the 135 world, such as with repair stations, MROs, flight schools, training organizations, brokers, catering and ground operations? And if so, then how do we get started? Anybody want to jump on that big one? Anybody want to talk about brokers? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, imagine who that came from. <laughs> well, you know, the, the SMS, uh, one of the interesting things in our organization was some of the other areas right away started catching on the SMS, maintenance and line operations. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, when we talk about audits and so forth, you, you may go through the whole audit, but who's gassing the airplane when you go somewhere? And, you know, uh, who's bringing out the catering and who's hangering it and, and that sort of stuff. So I think it's very valid that, yes, it should be spread uh, industry-wide. Now, uh, to Robert's point, you know, he says a, a customer should never have to ask if you got an SMS. So how do you market it if that's the case? Yeah, especially with people going for the low cost, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, we were at a major FBO chain, and their fuel truck ran into our airplane. So we did the whole SMS, you know, accident investigation. And we asked to coordinate with their SMS program. They didn't have one. And I was shocked. And it's a very big change. Hmm. Les, I think you had a question. My question would be, uh, should SMS be mandatory for Part 135 operations? Because it sounds like for those operators that travel to Europe, Europe is already requiring it. And if it should be, is there anything that the FAA can do? Because I know they're limited on manpower to help speed that process up because I think a couple of you mentioned that it took over two years to get the program approved. So what could be done? So 
Commissioner Les is asking, should Part 135, uh, should uh, SMS be required for Part 135? And the answer to that is yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, next question. And, <laughs> and what really, the truth be told, we'll leave that up to them to, uh -huh. to ask to answer the question. Of course, the NTSB does believe that it should be required. Uh, however, I want to hear from the panelists. That's what you it want to hear It needs to be streamlined. The, the gap analysis, the design demonstrations, the interchange between the regulators' analysis of what you present, it is very, it's a very heavy process. It's, it's in a lingo, <laughs> uh, if for those of you that ISO, it's very ISO-like. As a matter of fact, you almost don't need ISO if you have SMSVP. <laughs> it's arguable, of course, but if it could be streamlined somehow, that'd be great. Yeah, and so the question, another part of your question, Les, is what can the FAA do to facilitate SMS for Part 135, and I think we just heard a suggestion right there: is that, you know, that 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 it be maybe streamlined. But would others like to take a shot at that? Are they have they approved your SMS, or so there are two stages, right? There's participant, so there's recognition that you're underway, mm -hmm. and we were in our case for many have been pilot project and then it evolved and your almost pilot project is almost irrelevant except you have a lot of things in place. Uh, so now we're working in the final phases for our full compliance, which is the final design demonstrations. Active conformance. Right, active yeah. conformance, yeah. correct. So, but getting there is, it's time consuming. Uh, it requires tremendous administration. Um, it's, it's good, but it, you really need to learn how to decode it. You need to learn the language which is not the language that you're presenting to the working public in your organization. It's very, in, very internal. Well, part understand. of my question is, is the FAA in a position to approve at all of its FISDOs? Will they know how to approve? No, actually? staffing is a problem. So in our, as though, for example, the individual who was the experienced party and was learning and maturing with us in the process was now assigned to another task and someone else now has come into the process, so we probably stepped back a ways. We were first told by our FISDO that SMS would be a requirement for 135 operators in 2009. <laughs> yep. That was 11 years ago. Yeah, I think it's come along and it's uh, been pushed down the road. Any more questions out in the audience? In the back. Yeah, during the uh, FDM discussion, Seems like we heard a lot of folks talking about the value of programs for systemic application, meaning improving procedures, maintenance applications, and so forth. Also, heard some comments about it being able to catch those pesky pilots doing bad things. So the question is, how do you strike a balance? You know, how, how do you manage your program to get the data you need to affect? long-term organizational change or procedural change without it just becoming a gotcha program for your crews. Okay, let me paraphrase that. Um, how does uh, FDM become just a uh, um, get away from a gotcha program but uh, ties into, uh, you know, a monitoring program and, and get systemic things and actually is a excellent uh, program to uh, help help the, the whole community, the whole department out there. Anybody want to jump on that? I'll, I'll try to tackle that one. Um, so there's a couple different things that, that, that has to take place. And I think w one of them we talked about was just culture. Um, the organization m must you know, continue wanting continuous improvement because that's what it's all about, right? Um, so in the spirit of that, there are layers of, if, if you see an event, you're, you're going to investigate it, right? How you handle it and how you react to it is, is utmost important because the second that, that pilots feel like they're being disciplined or, you know, um, ratted out, if you will, because of that, the, the, the program will be very difficult to maintain. Um, so if, if you have an issue that you have to address, a gatekeeper is a central point, if you will, or a focal analyst or a flight data monitoring analyst uh, reaches out to the pilot uh, initially to figure out from their side 
what they experience. Um, there can be an ATC component, there could be a weather component. What they, what they experience is what they experience, right? What comes off the flight data recorder is what the aircraft went through. So when you mirror those two subjects together, you're able to take subjective data and objective data and, and create a, a fusion storyline, if you will, I think is what uh, MITRE or Asias is, is, is looking into. When you're looking at an investigation, um, you figure out what, what occurred. When you react to that, again, it's, it's extremely important. And if a pilot feels like they can't be trusted, then, then that, that spreads like wildfire. So the next, the next time after that conversation with the flight data monitoring analyst is, hey, thank you for the, the feedback. Um, you know, I hope this doesn't happen uh, to you again. Um, if it does, that's when the company, you know, look, these programs aren't designed to prevent a company from managing risk. Um, so if you have a willful violation, that's, it, it has to be handled one way or another. But what we try to do is investigate that and try to get to your determination before you even look at the flight data. The flight data will tell you what you think in your investigation that supports it. Um, and it. And it helps you in the end. Um, I, I don't know if that answered your question. Thank, thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. Here's an online question from Keith Amershek at Bode or Bode Aviation. I'm not sure exactly which it is in your backyard, Mike, uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. And, and Keith, Keith says, we're a small operation and our ASAP is very young and still in the demonstration phase. And we only have a very few reports, typically zero or maybe one per quarter. Is that a problem going forward uh, and with ASAP development? And uh, I see some head shakes. And Janine, I think you indicated you've had one ASAP program total, total, is that right? That's correct. And, and, and Jeff, how about you? I mean, any... Well, it, it certainly is not a problem unless things are not being reported. That's a great point. It's not a problem unless things are not being reported. Mm -hmm. And uh, so... But, but like you said, it's a sm he, he said he's a small operator, so he probably doesn't do that many flights. And I mean, if there was a report on every single flight, then we have a whole different problem, <laughs> right? <laughs> So I, I don't think it's un, uncommon, um, especially when you're starting out. You got to get the pilots to fill out the paperwork again, right? That's so why we're going to EFBs. Nobody wants to do paperwork. So um, it, it's just it, it's not a problem, and it'll continue to grow. Great. And uh, actually, I would say uh, keep up the keep up the good work there, and uh, keep plugging away. Uh, <laughs> so thank you for your question, and uh, got some encouragement from uh, from your colleagues here. I think Mr. Burns has a comment. Well, I, you know, I was just going to respond to the fleet size relative to the average number of reports per year, right? So um, here, let's just do this this way. So I, I was just mentioning the fleet size, number of employees enrolled in a small flight department. It's not uncommon, um, less than five aircraft or so, to have three to four reports a year, right? So. The key to all that, though, is like Jeff kind of touched on, is about the culture. Why aren't they reporting more? Because the volume and the activity may not just be there. Um, that's one reason. Or do many of your staff and many of your pilots haven't bought into it yet, and they're still reluctant? So you're right about one year, two years, until what we've, we've determined, it takes the first guy to step up and file an ASAP report when it's new and watch the floodgates open when they realize that's the way they handled it, that was the extent of the, you know, the process, get a little corrective action, and we move on, right? And hopefully it doesn't happen again. So it's, it takes a little time. It's a Thank trust you. factor. I'm sorry, Jeff? It's a trust factor. Get the what trust you're talking factor. About. Question, is that you, Sonny, in the back? Yep, it is. great. So your question is, do you think it would be beneficial to have official uh, SMS evaluators? And what would be the function of the SMS evaluators? To help um, the implementation of SMS around the country and not just rely solely on just a full-time FAA employee that designated, just like that designated flight standards that are civilian, uh, not FAA employees. 
I see. So that they could go and you saying basically designated examiners to to on behalf of the FAA to to put the holy water on on an SMS program. Well, and so we've heard that sometimes it is a problem within it with that within FAA staffing uh, to uh, to do that uh, to have uh, the adequate resources within the FAA to help set up these programs. So your thoughts, real quickly. Well, there's the opportunity there, right? I'm going to get together with you a little later, and we're going to start SMS VP Enterprises Incorporated, <laughs> and we'll be the tutors for a fee. I think the key, though, is that FAA wants this. It is from the regulator. There sh we should not have to then incur additional cost. But if you want to expedite, we often spend money anyway. So if the FAA were able to, if it's the FAA you're indicating able to provide that person, it's a great idea. If not, then maybe the thing to do is somehow get a rising up of a professional quorum that for a fee will guide an organization through the process, maybe as an alternative. Well, we already have some companies out there doing that kind right. of, don't we? Uh -huh. Right, but, but not enough. Not enough, but no. give me your thoughts on some of that. I know uh, the NTSB has been a little critical of uh, some of these companies and whether you got this standard or that. and. You know, did you pay for it? Did you really do something for it? Uh, did mm -hmm. they really audit you? Uh, give me your thoughts on the, these vendors. Anybody? Well, Come on, have, I know there's opinion here. If you have the FAA doing it, it's the blind leading the blind because they're not trained on SMS. Right. So that, seriously, right? I mean, let's be honest. <laughs> So I think having third party um, SMS people who can come in and can guide, at least that's their background. Their background and specialty is safety. And they don't necessarily have, it's, it's just, it's safety driven, all of them. At least all the auditors that we've run into, the ones that we've worked with, and, they, and a good auditor gives you the feedback, the corrective action afterwards. Not just, okay, well here's your score, but okay, we know these areas are weak. We've seen this in other industry, and. Quite frankly, I've learned the best from our auditors and these people that we've paid to come in to help us with our SMS because I, I'm not a specialist in it, um, to give me ideas on how other people are doing it. Because isn't that why we're all here? That's why I go to these conferences is to interact with other people. Well, I can't go to every conference because we've got companies to run. We have routes to fly. So having an auditor be able to come in, somebody who has been to other companies and give me ideas on how is somebody else doing this, I think it's very beneficial. And I think there's great value in it. Two questions. Mike, you can ask uh, and see if there's one, and I'll ask for the second one. Okay. Any more in the audience? Oh, Mr. Middleman over there. Excellent question, Jeff. And uh, I've been there myself with the MBAA Safety and Air Charter Safety Foundation. How do we reach that unreachable out there, that maybe smaller operator? Um, I've been to those safety symposiums and everything else over the years, and it seemed like the same people in the audience every time, and we were preaching to the choir. How do we reach the unreachable? Maybe, Jeff? A, maybe a mentoring program where we're companies that are willing to do it will reach out to some of the other companies that they know about that aren't attending these types of uh, things that aren't proactive in safety and say, hey, I'll be happy to help you with it. And you may get some great partnerships. Do, do they want to be reached? It, it, may have to be, it may have to be regulatory. Well, and that's the NTSB's position. Somebody said it may have to be regulatory, and so yeah. you're right. The people in this room probably are not the people that we'll be reading about in NTSB reports in a few years. Um, so that's why we feel like, you know, maybe regulation is not the answer to everything. But when it comes to safety, there does need to be a high bar, and it needs to be an equivalent level of safety. It should not be any different from your operation to your operation in terms of the, the way that you're managing risk to an acceptable level. 
There was a question back here, and that'll be the last question. Please go ahead. Um, my question for the panel was whether, as a result of your safety programs, you had any legal implications coming out of a lawsuit or something, either good or bad for your organization. It's a great question for the online folks. Uh, have, have there been any adverse legal implications coming out of your uh, legal department regarding your safety program? Or positive. Or positive. Okay. Mm -hmm. No. I think your answer was good, Jeff, if you just don't <laughs> tell them. The, the, demonstration, <laughs> the demonstration of that, or is to flip it around, that when people <clears throat> who do not participate in the program, do, or do not, they are then subject to legal actions. They lose a certificate, they're part of a lawsuit, et cetera. So the program does have positive effect if you participate. Yeah, I think Jeff's question and, and um, the chairman's comment on this is, is spot on. If, if I were the FAA, I'd probably be looking at the people that aren't you know, going to the safety symposiums, aren't Air Charter Safety Foundation members, aren't doing safety audits, aren't part of the SMS um, voluntary program, uh, don't have an ASAP program, don't have FDM, and, and see where that takes them. So uh, I will uh, go with the closing, uh, closing comments. There are, there are several um, notable quotables from today. And uh, I think this will be, this will be archived uh, on, on our YouTube channel or something. Would that, is that pretty close, Amy, somehow or another? Yep. So people can go back and watch it. Um, here's a couple of things that people have said today. Getting every employee to understand that they are part of SMS is key. SMS is no longer a requirement to us. We deserve it. In our safety incident reports, we ask, what's your corrective action? And get their feedback, which can be invaluable. Another comment is, we started our SMS by just passing audits. And now, it's a part of our culture. Wow, that's profound. And finally, it's not a matter of, of, it's not a matter of if SMS will be required for Part 135, it's a matter of when. And so often we find that when there are accidents, um, somebody gets involved and you have, have a requirement forced down your throat that you don't really want. We've seen that before. And, uh, and so it does, the industry I think probably does need to help police it, each other. You do, do need to be your brother's keeper. There are really operational and safety benefits to SMS and flight data monitoring. And I think the panel has, has beautifully illustrated some of those benefits. We, we, we know that it's scalable. Whether you have 100 aircraft or 10 aircraft, SMS can work for you. We hope that today's conversation will spur action into implementing or improving your safety management system in your operations and help you to implement or improve your flight data monitoring and one thing we heard today is one thing to collect the data, but it's another to, to yeah. use it. And that's the real challenge there is, as we heard the question, how do you take this information and look forward to say, this is how our operation can be adversely affected? I want to thank the panelists. You all have done a great job. I mean, this really, we wanted this to be a conversation, and I think it really has been a conversation. I want to thank my colleague Michael Graham. Mike, thank you. I want to thank Adam Gerhardt, and I uh, wish you a speedy recovery. <laughs> and uh, don't come into work until you've. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Amy Tyrone, Tim LeBaron, and all of the NTSB staff who, uh, James Anderson, who's right there taking a picture of me. Um, <laughs> Carl Perkins. There are a lot of people behind the scenes. Beverly Drake, Stephanie Shaw, and I'm sure I left someone out, but uh, we had a lot of folks that were behind the scenes to make this work. Brian Burns, I want to thank you. 
and the Air Charter Safety Foundation for working with Amy to figure out that we were going to do this. I think I did say, and also the Air Charter Safety Foundation. Finally, I want to thank those of you in the audience for paying attention, asking great questions, both here, live, and online. Thank you. Be safe. And God bless. Thank you. <laughs>